evening, everyone. Uh, we'll get started with our meeting. This is uh, Wednesday, August 16th, a regular meeting of the Scarborough Town Council. It's approximately 7 o'clock. You could all join me and rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Thank
of the new police barracks, or police station, I shouldn't call it barracks because it's not. I'm thinking of the old state police barracks, oh, police station and fire department, um, and withheld the sale of that building, of the current building, until a community center or senior center can be built so that it can, in the interim, be used as a senior center. We know that it has its issues, but it has way more space than anything we have available to us in town for senior programming. Um, so we would like that to be part of your considerations as you progress with this wonderful plan. Thank you. Oh, I unplugged something, I think. I think that's for a computer. Goes, that's but yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. I'm Susan Hamill, and I live at 3 Bay Street. And um, in spite of our town manager's letter to the public of July 14th, where he talks at length about improvements made to the budget process this year, which added transparency, inclusiveness, and clarity, we're not seeing an improved end product. We're here tonight to talk about the budget again. I'd like to speak about what I see as a continuing lack of transparency. First, I'm going to repeat a point I made last week about our lack of budget forecasting. Our school budget this year used up the last of the $2.1 million that was left from the Wentworth um, construction pro project. So we start next year's budget already deep in a hole. Add to this something that you haven't heard either the town manager or any counselor speak about, and that is the big tax abatement. Um, that the Maine Supreme Judicial Court required the town to pay on an ongoing property tax abatement case. This case involved approximately 50 taxpayers in the beach communities and goes back to 2012. Final details are still being worked, or are working their way through the court system because the taxpayers have filed an appeal of what they considered a woefully inadequate abatement by our town's Board of Assessment. What we do know is that the payment will be at least $475,000 and could ultimately be four times that amount. A decision is expected by December and payment will be made most likely this fiscal year. This is all public information. What's disturbing to me about this lack of transparency is that these are items which the public has a right to know and which the council has a need to know to better inform their decisions regarding the budget and when other important spending pro projects are considered, like the public safety building. Where's the inclusiveness that our town manager spoke about? Is it these one-way public comment periods? The council isn't listening. When citizens have a point of view which differs from that of certain council members, they are shamed and accused of being against the community and education, and it feels like the council just doubles down on what they've already decided. I like to compare the dysfunction of town government at this point to someone going on a diet. You can talk all you want about the diet, about nutrition, whatever you, what you need to do, but until you really get serious and change your actions, you'll never lose any weight. And likewise, the town manager and council can talk all day long about imp process improvements, but until they really listen to the public, and follow through on the changes that are needed, we will stay stuck right where we are. Thank you. Oh, Larry Hartwell, 9 Puritan Drive. Um, I know you're having a second reading on the, on the uh, school budget. Will there be time for comments at that point? Okay. Once again, Mike Doyle, Shady Lane, Falmouth, owner of FalmouthToday.me. I'd like to make a follow-up comment about the council rules. There's only two things you can control legally, and that's cursing or threats from the public forum. Any other objection or any other attempt to either control me or have me ejected from the meeting will once again result in a lawsuit where the town taxpayers have to pay for legal fees I've had three of them dismissed on technicalities. If you give me enough practice, I'm eventually going to get in front of a jury and let a jury decide whether your rules are legal or not. 
the hearing that I won, basically, was where Franco wanted me to pay for cell phone photos that I had taken of the 1,372 emails I inspected. And I laughed about it in front of Mr. Hall and Tody and the lady who's in charge of IT out in front of the courthouse. You guys initially wanted $3,900 for compiling the 1,372, having Bernstein Schur charge you $3,900 to review them before you release them to me. Uh, this is just a waste of money because if you guys stop doing really bad things in the offices and making email histories of them, you won't have to have somebody scour them for embarrassing information. But I've hooked up with a company or an organization in uh, Boston called the New England First Amendment Coalition, and they're interested in joining me in a federal lawsuit against Scarborough for some huge damages. So if you want to challenge me on freedom of access, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, I look forward to joining you in federal court. I think there will be a lot of interesting activity. Thank you. Anybody else that would like to speak? Not seeing any, we'll close the public comment and moving on to item number five, um, uh, minutes uh, for July, uh, uh, motion and acceptance of minutes for July 19th, 2017's regular meeting, August 2nd, special meeting and August 8th, special meeting. Is there a motion from council? So moved. Second. Is there any edits or modifications that need to be noted for the clerk? Not seeing any, all in favor? That is unanimous, thank you. And I am not aware of any adjustments to the agenda. I've already signed the treasurer's warrants and moving on to the first order. Order number 17-055 is a seven o'clock public hearing on the proposed fourth amendment to contract zone I, or is that, yeah, I, Frank R. Goodwin, E and F Limited Liability Company and Raymond C. Field, um, also known as Land Rover Dealership, located at 371 US Route 1. At this time, I'd like to open up the public hearing if anybody would like to speak on this item. Not seeing any, I will close the public hearing. And moving on to order number 17-064 is a seven o'clock public hearing and action on the new request for a food handler's license for James Morandi, doing business as Fairhaven Dunes located at three East Grand Avenue, tabled from the June, uh, sorry, July 19th, 2017 town council meeting. And um, I would like to open up the public hearing if anybody would like to get up and speak on the food handler's license. Not seeing any, we'll close the public hearing. Moving on to order number 17 65, it's a 7 o'clock public hearing. Is there an action on that last item? Yes. I apologize. Where's. Oh, and action. I apologize. Yes. Thank you. Um, so um, moving back to order number 17 064, and is there a motion from council? So moved. Second. Any comments or questions from council? Council St. Clair. Uh, to the clerk, this is, I'm assuming at this point, since it's brought back to us that everything's. Yes. Kosher. Everything yeah. is in okay. order. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Good. Has my approval then. Any other comments or questions? Not seeing any. All those in favor? And that is unanimous. Thank you, Councilor Rowan. Um, order number 17 65. It's a 7 o'clock public hearing on the proposed amendments to the Higgins Beach character based zoning districts. Before we have public comment, I'd like to turn it over to the manager and to our planning department for a brief presentation on the item. Yes, Jay Chase is just making his way to the podium. Uh, Jay has been involved with this process since the beginning and has a few prepared uh, remarks, I guess. Um, namely, there's some uh, changes that will be recommended uh, by way of amendments in second reading, and perhaps we can at least highlight, highlight those tonight before public comment is taken. Yep, thank you, Tom. Mr. Chair, if you're uh, prepared. Um, as noted in the council packet, uh, you should have received a memo from me dated August 11th, I believe it was, that highlights a few additional changes from the first reading um, for the Higgins Beach Character Code. Um, a couple of those, we, or at least one of those we talked about during the initial first reading, uh, particularly with regards to the language uh, for non-conforming structures. Um, that was something that was still under review, um, and there's been some tweaks to that. So we actually are proposing to add a, a sub, sort of a subsection uh, under the first paragraph um, that's really designed to enable structures that don't meet front yard setbacks to be able to add on to the front, to the front of the house. The reason for that is in the character code, we have a, a minimum um, 
uh, front yard setback. We also have a maximum front yard setback. Um, so the prior standard sort of said non-conforming structures can add on within the building placement, the, basically the building envelope. Um, but if someone were set back, say, 30 or 40 feet from their front yard, the maximum front yard setback is 21 feet. They really ostensibly wouldn't be able to meet that front yard setback. So that's what that language is designed to do. Um, the other item that was in your packet and noted in the uh, August 11th memo um, had to do with porch encroachments. Um, one of our Eagle Eye residents picked up on a, something we failed to uh, strike through. Um, and actually, as we looked at that, one of the other things that came up had to do with porches are currently, or yes, currently, under the adopted language, states that they're allowed only with the uh, primary entrance and they're allowed certain encroachments into setbacks. Um, but with this revised change, um, it was thought that, or thought that uh, porches might be permissible or should be permissible, not just with primary entrances, but on other areas uh, of the building. So this gets to the idea of sort of being more flexible with the allowed components. Um, so the proposal in your packet provides for certain uh, setback re uh, uh, reductions, if you will, for porches, particularly on the rear yard and in a secondary setback. A secondary setback is someone who might have a corner lot and um, one road is considered their primary and the other is considered their secondary. Um, and then really there's just two other very small administrative changes that are being proposed. One, um, under the current language, we currently have language that says that uh, Buildings that are less than 15 feet from a property line need to meet uh, fire rating standards. This, um, uh, but really the building code requirement is a five foot setback. And so we think that was just an error in the original um, uh, adoption process. And we're proposing to strike the 15 and make that a five. Um, so anyone who's within five feet of their building uh, with a, within another building or their setback would need to meet the fire rating standards. And then the other is just with the proposed language for non-conforming use. Right now, the language that we proposed at first reading, the new section was titled non-conforming uses structures. We should probably add the word and in between non-conforming uses and structures. So um, very much an administrative item. But since we're here doing the process, I flag it for you all. So like I said, hopefully that memo would clarify these things for you and appreciate the time. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to ask um, if the uh, chair of the ordinance committee has anything to add regarding the process that was undertaken so the citizens might um, understand that before we open it up to public comment. Uh, yeah, for the uh, character code, uh, that didn't come before the ordinance committee. Uh, that was long range planning, uh, reviewed it carefully. I think uh, uh, Councilor Caso might be able to speak to that, but certainly uh, uh, I attended the June workshop. Uh, that was held uh, at the Higgins Beach Association Clubhouse. Uh, it was well attended. Uh, there was uh, a significant opportunity to understand what was being done. The, the attitude that has been expressed by the community is that uh, they think uh, the code definitely goes in the right direction. It needs to be tweaked to be able to reduce uh, the height of structures, the massing of structures, uh, uh, and the simplification of roof lines. And that, that's really the, what I heard uh, in, uh, from the community at Higgins Beach. And, and this ordinance I, apparently does it. Uh, Councilor Chiazzo, as our liaison to long range planning, anything to add to the public? Uh, no, I'll just piggyback on what Bill said. Um, we did look at it kind of intently around the structure side structures and, and additional garage space or something, I think that, and we did review the fire code substantially. So. Um, certainly no objections that we noted at the long-range planning and haven't heard any uh, citizen feedback negatively and also attended the, the session down at Higgins Beach and it was very, very positive, very open and I think it's a step in the right direction. And again, this isn't firm and final, this is a living document, so the tweaks I think are designed to kind of get more in line with the overall intent of what the what the character code was to begin with. So no, no opposition, no, no concerns. Thank you. With that information, I'd like to open up the public hearing. If there's anybody that would like to get up and speak on the item, you're welcome to go to the podium. You'll have three minutes. Can I ask you a question? Good evening. I'm Walter Wilson from the design company. <coughs> I 
do a lot of work in, throughout New England, and a lot of work at Higgins Beach. Um, I think currently I've done over 60 projects in Higgins Beach alone. Um, in relation to this ordinance, I recognize that a lot of, I, I got some notes here, I haven't had time to write them out intelligibly, and so I'm going to skip around, I hope not, not too confusing. I recognize, I recognize that a lot of work and time and thought has gone into the character-based ordinance. The CDCR1 district was established in order to make properties able to expand or be rebuilt on the smaller size lots. The setbacks were reduced and the lot coverage was changed into a building envelope area and that allowed for more square footage of construction on the lots. During the various meetings leading up to the adoption of the current ordinance, I was, and still am, in agreement with the reduction in setbacks, but I raised concern about the imposing of design restraints on long-established properties at Higgins Beach. It has always been, it's always seemed to me that the property owner should be able to construct a home, add to a home, or remodel a home in a way that suits his personal taste and needs. Of course, the zoning ordinance should set certain dimensional requirements that are needed to protect the neighborhood and the community. In Higgins Beach, over a hundred years of history has evolved from the original styles of structures into a variety of styles that are now present. This is the character of Higgins Beach, diversity. The CDCR1 district um, regulations were set up to control mostly new construction and do not address existing properties. Um, the CDCR1 zone allows for three types of buildings uh, to be built, a cottage, a bungalow, and a new house or a home. Uh, during that review process, I stated that many times at the meetings that the cottage and bungalow styles would not be utilized and that only the house style would be built. And that is what's taken place. Most of the homes at Higgins Beach do not meet the proposed restrictions that this new proposal will dictate. And I'm talking about the existing homes that have been there for decades. The new proposal limits structures to a rectangular box with one roof line. The majority of homes at Higgins Beach do not comply with this basic form. The proposed ordinance states that the homes are too large and have various divine design features that are not in character with Higgins Beach. Well, as far as the height goes, prior to the ordinance that's in effect now, the height restriction was 35 feet. This ordinance put it at 32 feet that we have now. The proposed ordinance will even reduce that more, not in the maximum allowed under the ordinance, but in the way the fine print says you have to build a building. Mr. Wilson, just so you know, you are out of time, but if you can wrap that up for us, it would be appreciated. Okay. Well, I think there's a lot of things I, I, I wrote down that I was going to talk about. I indicated that I didn't have enough time to talk about them all. Uh, some of those I've already discussed with Jay and Brian. Um, but I will say that the history of Higgins Beach has created a variety of styles down there. And this ordinance puts you into a box and you can only add boxes to it. And it's out of style with the character of Higgins Beach. And I would propose, I'll jump ahead a couple pages. In close. <laughs> I would ask that the council send this revision of the ordinance back to the planning board for a workshop followed by a public hearing in order to thoroughly review and understand what these impl implications are for the Higgins Beach community. If that is not done, I would hope that the council would at least allow a time period of at least three months or so after the passage of the ordinance before it's put in effect so that the projects that are being planned could be received, uh, could receive building approvals without having to start all over again. Um, and last, let's find my page. In any event, I would hope that the council would not approve the revised character-based zoning ordinance in its current form until a more detailed and constructive review has been completed. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else that would like to get up and speak? Hi, Melissa Crippio, 31 Morning Street. 
I also was at the June meeting and I walked away with some understanding of um, broad strokes discussion and some specifics about roof lines and height. Um, I wasn't aware that there was a finalized proposal until yesterday and that's on me. You could make a case that that's on me. And if it were only me that that was on, I wouldn't even be standing here. But every neighbor, save two, that I talked to today also wasn't aware of it. So um, I feel a duty, I guess, to kind of speak out for them. There were some changes in the proposals. I read the 57 pages. And there are some changes in there that aren't about roof lines and aren't about um, height that concern me. And I would just hope that we can have enough time between tonight and when the final vote is that maybe we can work again with the planning department and work that out, work those tweaks out so that the whole community is really informed about what the final proposal is. Thank you. Thank you. And if I can ask, when you do speak, if you can bring the microphone closer to you, because I had some people in the back I don't believe can hear uh, some of the comments. Yeah, perfect. Hi, Regina Day, 24 Ocean Avenue at Higgins Feet. And I appreciate all of your work. I know that there was a, a lot of effort and cost that went into researching what we have now. Um, and I, too, was at not this June's, but the previous uh, workshop at the clubhouse at Higgins Beach. And it was my understanding that this ordinance, the current ordinance, would make it so that people who had existing homes would be able, able to bring them along a little bit at a time. And, you know, that appealed to me as a working family who's been at Higgins Beach since the 60s um, and has children in college. So my feeling is, you know, that with the height restriction especially, that kind of catered to folks who are able to jump on the phone and hire the consultants and get the surveyor over there that day, bring in the architect and do it all quick, where many of us who have been there a darn long time aren't able to do that. So I ask you to um, consider again the unique nature of our place and to uh, give it a lot of thought before you just pass this by. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to speak on this item? Not seeing any, we'll close the public hearing. Thank you. Moving on to order number 17-066. It's a 7 p.m. public hearing on the proposed amendments to Chapter 405, the Town of Scarborough Zoning Ordinance, Section 12, Sign Regulations. Before we open it up to public hearing, I'd like to ask the Chair of the Ordinance Committee to provide us with an overview <coughs> of the work and process undertaken so far. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just to speak about the process to, so that anyone watching out there and, and the audience hasn't been uh, as current on this as uh, uh, they might uh, want to be. Uh, this is the public hearing stage. We had a first reading. Uh, we'll have a public hearing now. And then we'll have a second reading at which there'll be a opportunity for public input in advance of uh, our uh, voting on it. Uh, there may also be amendments. Uh, the ordinance committee process here was really about four or five months where uh, Councillor Roman and St. Clair and I worked hard to try and come up with something that would address the concerns that we had identified through communications from the community as well as other councillors. Uh, they really broke down into a number of categories. The first was that uh, a U.S. Supreme Court case of 2015 uh, established that signage on the roadway in the right-of-way uh, needed to be content neutral. And what that simply means is you can't have a set of rules for realtor signs, different set of rules for church supper signs, uh, different set of rules for political signs. They all have to be subject to things like uh, they can be up the same amount of time, they have to be down because we're talking about a temporary sign ordinance, uh, a certain period of time, uh, they have to be uh, within the same size. Can't vary those things uh, at all. They have to be content neutral. So that was a, a big challenge, which I must say the uh, planning department, uh, Jay Chase and the assistant town manager, Larissa Crockett, did a wonderful job. Uh, we worked endlessly at drafts to get that aspect done because 
that was something that the Ordinance Committee really needed to be handed uh, as a work product. The second thing that we tried to uh, do with these changes was to protect the scenic vistas and ecologically sensitive areas of Scarborough. And these are uh, really the, the Scarborough Marsh areas that you see from uh, Pine Point Road, Route 1, and Black Point Road. There were others uh, that certainly qualified as scenic vistas in our community because we have many. Uh, but uh, we were guided by our attorney who said we needed to properly tailor and uh, restrict uh, it to just those areas that seemed most appropriate. Uh, and so we did. We uh, consulted with Scarborough Land Trust. They had a number of uh, properties that they suggested uh, uh, be restricted, but we chose not to do that, just to err on the side of not uh, overreaching. Uh, another area that we tried to address was to promote public safety. There has been an obvious proliferation of, of temporary signs uh, 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 on the roadways uh, in recent years, and we wanted to be able to address that, particularly at intersections because signs along the roadway, people can see them, read them, process it without putting themselves, pedestrians, bicyclists, or other motorists at risk. Uh, but when you get within X feet, and in this case we chose 50 feet, of very busy uh, high accident intersections, we felt it was appropriate to restrict signs within that 50 feet. Uh, this is within the right of way. 51 feet, yes, you can, ha you can put, you put your sign, whatever it might be. Uh, but uh, for those eight intersections, uh, and they were identified as the most uh, problematic from an a, a accident point of view by Chief Moulton and the data that uh, the police department keeps. Uh, lastly, we wanted to control just the general proliferation of identical signs. And the way the ordinance is, reads at the moment is uh, identical signs or similar signs. Uh, I attended the planning board public hearing uh, recently, <clears throat> uh, and the suggestion was made by several planning board members that the use of a phrase like similar signs is problematic, because who's to say uh, whether a sign for a particular candidate in one color is similar to one that sends a slightly different message, either about that candidate or about that issue. Uh, that is, that uh, issue of uh, uh, concern was also raised by several members of the public in emails that we've gotten. So I've uh, been making a list of changes that I think might be appropriate. I'm going to try and confer with my uh, fellow ordinance committee members so that we can meet in advance of the second reading so as to be able to gain a consensus on how to take advantage of all the good input that we've received from the public. Uh, uh, the uh, proliferation of signs issue was addressed by saying you can have a sign every one-tenth of a mile, which I've learned is 528 feet. Uh, uh, and so, and, and people said, well, gee, this, that sounds restrictive. So I said, well, you're going 35, 40 miles an hour along the road. How often would you see that same sign? It's every eight seconds. And I just said to myself, every eight seconds? I think I've seen enough. Uh, if I go for several miles and every eight seconds, I'm seeing the same sign with the same message. Uh, so that's, uh, that's how we at least came to uh, uh, feel that was an appropriate uh, uh, setback. It isn't actually every 528 feet because the way we wrote it, we had to deal with cross streets. And we agreed that the uh, setback distance of 528 feet would not apply to uh, cross streets. So that every time you come to a cross street, of which our town has many, you would then be able to have another sign. So it, it gets to be, a, 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 it's a, what I would consider a, an appropriate setback dimension. Uh, it's, uh, it's not uh, unnecessarily uh, rigorous. So uh, other things that we looked at, uh, uh, people raised questions about how to measure distances uh, from 
when you can have a sign, turn to the next one. And we're working on that. I met with Jay Chase, uh, the planning director. Uh, we're going to come up with language because that, as pointed out to us by members of the public, is a very legitimate point. And we hadn't really worked out the details of that. And we are working that out with uh, the planning the planning director, and hopefully then the uh, ordinance committee will be able to come together on that. Uh, Is that it, Councillor? <laughs> uh, uh, another good comment that we received from the public was uh, that uh, we had a six-week interim period when signs needed to be removed. You can have them up for three consecutive weeks, uh, and then they had to be removed for six weeks. Uh, it was pointed out that and we're in the midst of it right now, that we've had three consecutive referendum votes. And those votes would uh, restrict inappropriately uh, the placement of signs for the, whether you're a pro uh, supporter of passing the school budget or opposed to passing the school budget. And it was never our intention to, uh, to Im impede that process. So again, another change which I think could quite appropriately be reduced from six weeks to one week. So those are kind of the amendments that we're working on. We've got a couple other technical amendments, not worth mentioning here, but that's kind of where we are right now. Thank you very much. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, sorry, point of clarity. Um, just for the record, I think, on the agenda, it says public hearing. In our packet, it says second reading, so we may want to adjust that for the minutes for no. next time. It's just the the second reading on the proposed will be held. Mm -hmm. Isn't it's it's oh, it has been scheduled. My apologies. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Any better than that? Um, so, sorry, with that, um, are there any public comments? <coughs> Mike Doyle, Shady Lane, Falmouth. Uh, I'm always surprised at the arrogance of government, local government, uh, doing things like this. In Falmouth, I'm glad to hear that you consulted an attorney because in Falmouth they consulted an attorney to uh, do a protocol that you had to fill out to do a freedom of access request. To come to find out, <coughs> town council in Falmouth didn't have any authority to amend a state law. They spent $3,000 with Drummond and Woodson, just wasted money. No one's ever filled out the protocol, it's never been used, but they spent $3,000 to do it. But I'm glad you folks have checked with an attorney. Uh, Content-based restrictions, and every sign has content, Violates U.S. Supreme Court decision in Whitney v. California, 274 U.S. 357, 375, 1927, Brandeis J. concurring. Content-based restrictions are presumptively unconstitutional as in RAV v. the City of St. Paul, Minnesota, 505 U.S. 377, 382, 1992, and even more stringent in Reed v. Town of Gilbert, Arizona, 576 U.S. 2015, which is, I think, the councilor was referring to. That decision was reversing the Ninth District's decision. This is going to be one of those things that's not going to survive the first challenge. You guys are going to waste thousands and thousands of dollars in legal fees because you cannot have content based advertising uh, restrictions on, especially on political uh, uh, decisions on budgets, town council elections, things like that. The most stringent protection in freedom of speech is political free speech. And you cannot control this with a town ordinance. And if you want to try to do that, I hope I have a chance to challenge it uh, somehow with a sign someplace in Scarborough. And having signs 528 feet apart even might be something that you like to see. Uh, I think the state law was 30 feet apart. That's not even enforceable. In the town of Falmouth, we have uh, political signs every 15 inches so people can read from one sign to the next. You know why it's not enforced? Because they can't enforce it. It's a violation of a U.S. Supreme Court ruling three different ways. So if you guys go forward with this, all the taxpayers here, that's where your tax dollars are going to go, and legal fees trying to defend something that's indefensible. And the, guy, the thought that you guys come up with these cocky mamie ideas is just unbelievable. This is why I have so much material in the town of Scarborough. I don't have problems in the town of Cumberland. I asked Bill Shane for uh, information, have it the next day. Nat Tupper and Yarmouth, next day. The two towns that, that dog, dog at the uh, uh, resist information is this town at the highest level I've ever seen because there's probably more bad stuff in this town. 
and the second town is Falmouth that I deal with. So if you guys want to go ahead with this, just get the legal checkbook going because you're going to be paying a ton of money, and I hope I get a chance to litigate over this. Thank you. Larry Hartwell, 9 Puritan Drive. Uh, I see two points to this ordinance. One is to address the Supreme Court on neutral um, content. Uh, that's pretty simple to, to straighten out in, in the current one. Just eliminate the references to the real estate, um, realtor signs, the political signs, the for sale signs, so forth, and have the one set of criteria. We've taken care of it. Uh, the other thing that I see being addressed here is simply political signs. It's not stated, but that's what it's all about. Now, I know people in this room, I have friends that don't like all these signs. They don't want to see them all clustered together. A lot of people say that, depend, no, no matter what perspective they have politically. Um, but we are talking about temporary signs here. Three weeks, three weeks at a maximum. Under the heading of sensitive or scenic areas, at least nine streets or sections of street will no longer be allowed to have any temporary signs, including, of course, the political signs. No one wants to see these signs end up in the marsh and, uh, or in streams. So why don't we look and say, okay, if the street's within 25 or 50 feet of a body of water, then we prohibit it there, not all this, this nine streets being taken out here. Um, the worst part about this ordinance is the, having the signs one-tenth of a mile apart. Currently, it's 30 feet apart. A tenth of a mile, uh, as we've heard earlier, it's 528 feet. A tenth of a mile. Um, our people, our political parties, groups are going to have to hire surveyors to put them 528 feet to be in compliance. Are you going to have public works go out and put monuments in? 528 feet on every major road in town so that we comply with this. Um, it's, it's ridiculous. Uh, beyond the logistics, questions still to be asked, questions needing answers. Why after the resounding defeat of the town council approved school budget in June did we get such a restrictive temporary ordinance signed within weeks? Way beyond addressing the simple mandates of the court. Does this honor ordinance look more like one designed to reduce political free speech, Practically, particularly citizens with opinions that are different than the council? Does reducing voter turnout serve some purpose we have yet to learn about? Here we are in Scarborough. Have we devolved to Augusta and in Washington? Questions, questions to be answered. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Benjamin Howard, 7 Windsor Pines. Uh, I spoke at the first reading uh, in regards to this ordinance, specifically uh, in regards to Section J, stating that it was unconstitutionally restricting free speech um, in the regards to banning uh, temporary signs at the uh, listed locations. Um, at the time, I referenced two cases, Pelts for City of South Euclid, and Baldwin versus City of Red, uh, Baldwin versus Redwood City. Um, both towns uh, had very similar ordinances to ours. There were some clear differences, but each ordinance argued um, that it was for aesthetics, safety, and cleanliness of the town. Um, I've gone in and read the uh, court comments from each of those cases and would like to read some here. Um, in the case of Pelts versus City of South Euclid, the comments were, we are of the opinion that the purpose to keep the streets clean and of good appearance is insufficient to justify an ordinance which prohibits a person rightfully on a public street from handing out literature to one willing to receive it. As we have pointed out, the public convenience and respect to cleanliness in the streets does not justify an exertion of the police power which invades the free communication of information and opinion secured by the Constitution. To go on to the Baldwin v. Redwood City case, the court comments were, much that we encounter offends our aesthetics. It is not our political and moral sensibility, but the burden normally falls upon the viewer to avoid further bombardment of his sensibilities simply by averting his eyes. Again, I agree these signs were annoying, um, but it is as simple as just don't look at them. 
Um, also, in each of these decisions, uh, the courts found that temporary signs generally were political signs and made much of their rulings in those um, in that regards, stating that banning these signs at uh, the location takes away from a very pertinent form of communication. Um, signs provide a more localized uh, platform for people to express their opinions than radio and are very cheap and probably the cheapest way other than hand pamphlets to hand out. Also, uh, to go on further, uh, in the case of public safety, I remind you that this case is from 1971. Um, the court comments were, considering the universe of distractions that face motorists on our city's streets, temporary political posters are not sufficiently significant to justify such a serious restriction upon political expression. Remind you, 1971, this is before the cell phone is put in the hands of drivers. Now, I have reached out to Chief Moulton and got the information about the traffic accidents of each of these stops, but I failed to follow up and get the dates of these accidents so that I could run an analysis to see if there was statistical significance that would suggest political signs, temporary, actually caused an increase in accidents. Um, during the time for the second reading, I will try to get this information. If I find that there is nothing there, I would urge the council to please amend section J of this ordinance. Thank you. Good evening, Jean Marie Caterina, 311 Gorham Road. And I well, didn't originally uh, intend to speak tonight. And actually, I was very glad to hear that this is not the second hearing. Um, just a few things that I'd like to mention. Um, my concerns with this particular ordinance, uh, one is as a real estate broker, real estate professional, uh, we frequently place temporary signs and, uh, and it could be that I misread uh, something in the ordinance today because I didn't get a chance to read it very closely, but uh, there was something to the effect of uh, a six month limit on private properties. Um, in this market, okay, if I've got a sign up there, uh, it better be gone before six months or I'm not doing my job. But there may be markets where it could be longer, but it could be that I mis misconstrued something that I read there. And if I did, I apologize for that. But it's just something to take into consideration. My other concerns are I think you're getting too far into the weeds as to uh, where to ban them for so-called scenic views. I absolutely understand the marsh area but to then further delineate uh, other parts in town. Um, meh, I think that's getting a bit much. Uh, and then the, uh, my third concern is enforcement. It's like, who's going to enforce this? I know having been a political candidate, um, our town clerk gets calls uh, frequently on, oh, so-and-so signs this and so-and-so signs that. Uh, and having to, her having to, or whoever's in that job having to deal with that, it uh, can be a real uh, pain uh, to be blunt about it. Um, so that, that would be my other concern. But, uh, and then my very last point is the main Department of Transportation already has rules out there for political signs. In particular, um, I would suggest that the council go back and look at what DOT already says about intersections and placement of signs or whatever uh, because to have two sets I can, I can just see it during political season now. So uh, as consistent and as simple as we can get it um, and being fair and not <coughs> infringing on people's rights to uh, have signs uh, would be the way to go. Thank you. Susan Hamill, uh, 3 Bay Street. These ordinance changes clearly target political signs. Yeah, some of them make good sense, like protecting scenic vistas, such as the Scarborough Marsh along Route 1. And some are, in, are required because of the Supreme Court case, um, which require municipalities to be content neutral in their approach to signs. And I agree that the political signs can be really annoying. Um, we all remember how annoying they were last fall all along Route 1. Um, when we saw the Trump signs and the Hillary signs just one right after another. But these changes proposed tonight go far beyond the changes that are required by Reed and common sense. 
temporary signs would be prohibited from the town's eight busiest intersections, basically our town center. Um, and the claim that this is to ensure public safety, there is no evidence to suggest that these signs present a hazard. The proposed ordinance would also prohibit signs along the entire length of the Pine Point and Black Point roads with a couple of little areas where you could put a sign. And whether it's 500 feet, I, I'm not even sure of that. So there'd be one sign. Temporary signs such as those used before elections are a rudimentary form of communications in the digital age. Yet they remain a very important and effective form of communication. These ordinance changes as proposed will limit our ability to inform and educate the broader electorate on important issues and will lead to smaller voter turnout, result in town management making decisions on key issues with limited public input. We believe that an engaged and informed electorate is best able to make decisions affecting all of us. Anything which limits discussion, involvement, and engagement of the electorate hurts us all and is an infringement on our First Amendment right to free speech. We should celebrate the engagement that we've had in Scarborough and not try to squelch it. The timing of these proposed changes coming in the midst of this summer's heated budget referendum process feels like a personal vendetta. Let's just table this until some time has passed after we pass a budget. Anybody else that would like to speak? Not seeing any, uh, we will close the public hearing and there is no action. Um, next order is order number 17-067, it's a 7 o'clock public hearing on the proposed amendments to Chapter 601, Town of Scarborough's Traffic Ordinance, Section 25, regarding parking restrictions. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to turn it to the manager to provide an overview. This is uh, really just a, a fairly simple housekeeping matter. Uh, it is a modest amendment to the traffic ordinance, clarifying parking on East Grand Avenue um, in the area of Pine Point, intersection of Pine Point Road. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if Chairman Donovan, the chairman of the uh, yeah. Ordinance Committee, has any further input. But uh, Yes, the, uh, the Police Department brought this to the Ordinance Committee's attention. Uh, it really involves uh, uh, designation of parking locations needing clarification. Uh, uh, rather than eliminating parking, uh, it really was just trying to be more precise uh, to update the ordinance in that regard. It was also updating uh, the spaces reserved for businesses. And uh, the ordinance provisions for East Grand Avenue had some uh, allowance of uh, limited business rights. And as businesses had changed over time, that needed to be updated. So pretty administrative. Thank you. With that, I'd like to open up a public hearing. Would anybody like to speak on the item? Not seeing any, we'll close the public hearing. Thank you. And moving on to order number 17-068, it's a 7 o'clock public hearing on the proposed amendments to Chapter 604A, Town of Scarborough's Horse Beach Permit Ordinance, Section 604A-6, Regulations of Horses on the Beach. If we could have an overview from the Ordinance Committee Chair. Certainly. Uh, again, pretty simple amendment. Uh, uh, the ability to keep Pine Point Beach clean is important. Uh, uh, we do allow along with Old Orchard Beach uh, uh, permits to have people ride on the beach from uh, at the end of the summer season uh, through, to, through the winter into the spring. Uh, it is, uh, uh, we originally had a provision like this in the ordinance, but Old Orchard Beach did not. We combined our process with Old Orchard Beach just to coordinate uh, the issuance of permits, and we dropped it at that time. Uh, input from the public has indicated to us that it remains a problem, and I think common sense tells us it's a problem. Uh, these are very large animals, the horses getting on and off to pick up uh, 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 waste is no easy task. Uh, so uh, these bun bag devices that can be attached to the back of horses so as to collect the manure uh, is something that we feel is appropriate. 
Thank you. With that, I'd like to open up the public hearing. Would anybody like to speak about our horse permits? Not seeing any, we'll close the public hearing. And moving on to order, um, actually I forgot to mention under adjustments, order number 17-073 was a public hearing for a special amusement permit that has actually been withdrawn by the applicant. So we will not be taking that up. I apologize for not mentioning it earlier. Um, order number 17-074 is a 7 p.m. public hearing and action on the new request for a food handler's permit from P&E Fitness doing business as Lifestyle Fitness Center located at 29 Pleasant Hill Road. Is there anybody, I'd like to open up to public hearing. Is there anybody that would like to speak on the food handler's license? Not seeing any, we'll close the public hearing. Is there a motion from council? So moved. Second. Any comments or questions? Not seeing any, all in favor? And that is unanimous, thank you. Moving into old business, order number 17-071, a second reading on the fiscal year 2018 school budget. Um, I would like to open up the floor for any comments uh, from the public. Would anybody like to speak? Not seeing any, I'll turn it over to the manager. Oh, apologize. Excuse me for my tardiness. Uh, Larry Hartwell, 9, Puritan Drive. Um, we had a $50,000 suggestion that we, re we um, reduce the budget at the last uh, meeting. Uh, that's about one tenth of percent. So 6.8, 6.9, tomato, tomato, really doesn't make any difference. It's now August. Many people on all sides have worked very hard for literally months on, on this budget. Given the late date, let's consider providing the schools with $1,200,000 more than last year. If you will be satisfied, then we can move on and hopefully do better next year. Thank you. Thank you. thoughts about um, Elaine Richer, 2080 Grand Avenue, Fibrief Lane. At one of the council meetings, one of the school board members was concerned because we are at it again with multiple vote situation. How can this happen when the process between the town council and the school board went off so well? So let's look at this process that works so well. The school board prepares their budget on the needs and wants of the school. They are not given a maximum percentage increase by the council, so basically they can disregard the taxpayer's ability to pay, the cost of living index, the increase in social security, and a number of other things. There's also no dialogue between the taxpayers and the school board. There is a public comment position <coughs> where, where I'm standing right now. I'm talking to you, you are looking at me. That's about what the dialogue is that we have. So where does it lead the public? The taxpayer has to see the town budget cut to meet the demands of the school budget. That's a possibility. We can live with what the school board proposes by voting yes, second. Or negatively weigh in at the bo voting booth. If the vote prevails, negative no vote prevails, those taxpayers are villainous or villainized as enemies of the children, education, and let's throw in the American way. When all they wanted was a realistic increase to reflect the economy that's going on right now in our state and what's happening to people with their jobs and so forth. I mentioned in one of my emails to the council that if Scarborough continues on this same path, this same process next year, and you expect different results, then Scarborough will be the definition of insanity. Thank you. Marge DeSanctis, 54 Beach Ridge Road. I want to clarify that percentage. The school board came in at 2.89. The reason you're hearing the 6.8, 6.9 or whatever is because of Augusta and the people you have voted in in Augusta who have constantly over many, many years, every year taken money away from Scarborough and other towns. 
we lost 1.4 million this year. So not only do you have raises and, and utility changes and et cetera, et cetera, the school board budget came in at 2.89 and only went up to that 6.8 to add in the amount that they have to make up because Augusta took it away. So if you're mad at anybody, be mad at your representatives in Augusta. Wallace Fengler, 233 Holmes Road. I think in the future we need a, a new mindset, and that is to look for efficiencies. I, I was reading the uh, comprehensive plan, and in that plan it says do more with less resources. And what's been happening is they don't really, f the school board doesn't really feel like there's any limitation on how much they can spend, and I'll give you an example. I read in the paper where they were going to have a new position um, that where the person would interface with businesses and find uh, internships and jobs for students, and the price was going to be $70,000. I, my best man, 30 years ago, Dale Huntress, had that job he was a teacher. He got a teacher's salary. When they had eliminated industrial arts, he went to all the businesses and he found jobs for students and it was at a teacher's salary. In the future, if the school board would look for efficiencies, maybe we wouldn't be having so many votes. But uh, my, my son came up with an idea why not have this position be like a track coach or a basketball coach? Why not give them a stipend? Why not have a teacher do this job? So one of the things that I advocate for is cost-benefit analysis. How many students are going to get jobs? They have to be 16 or older to start with. And what is this person going to be doing most of the time? After he finds a job for a student, his job's done with that student. So you don't really need $70,000 position and you don't need a secretary to go with that and where do you go from there? If you start at 70000 where are you going to end up? So I need, you need to be thinking about cost efficiencies and cost benefit analysis. Thank you. Larry Hartwell, 9 Puritan Drive. Uh, something I left out of the conversation is that $2.1 million was taken from reserves and used in the school budget this year. That helped reduce the impact. That $2.1 million won't be there next year. Jess Libby, 501 Black Point Road. <sighs> I'm listening to everything that's being said and I'm really frustrated because before you even came up with the $50,000, which you have to remove because 83 people didn't show up to vote, um, the Smart Taxes Group of Scarborough already said, we're going to vote no, we're not going to pass this unless they make drastic huge cuts. And that's just crazy, 83 votes. Positions that, you know, that gentleman was talking about. Do you know how many students signed up for that program and who are starting this fall? And it's just gone because of this whole crazy budget process. We need to support our schools. They're not being greedy. They created a budget that was reasonable and worked for the town. It's a 2.91% increase. We just need to pass it. We need to stop the game and all of this back and forth. And that's really all I have to say. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to speak? If you'd like to line up, you're welcome to do that as well. No? Okay. Hi, I'm Hillary Durgan <clears throat> on Sequoia Lane. And um, I wasn't going to come up tonight because I'm here every time and you all know what I'm going to say, which is that um, I, I support the schools. I support the people who are making the decisions um, about the schools. I think the school board has done an excellent job of um, 
presenting us with a really responsible budget. Um, and I thank them for all their hard work. I think that um, if there's any more than a $50,000 reduction, $50, reduction that I probably couldn't support the budget, which I voted for now twice in a row, I voted yes for. Um, I'm not happy with another $50,000 being cut from our budget because I think that you're just, you know, um, it's like dying a death of, of a million cuts or whatever they call it. Um, so um, I urge you to stick with the 50000 and don't go above that. Um, and hopefully we can get this passed and just kind of move on. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Not seeing anybody. I'm going to close the public hearing. Thank you very much. Moving on to the actual motion. Um, so it's a very long uh, budget order, and I um, don't think it's necessary to read the entire thing unless there's any objection from council, but I'll go ahead and at least um, read the section that is impacted the most. Um, and that is, be it further ordered, the school, um, this is in the form of a motion, be it further ordered that the school budget be reduced by a total of $50,000, and therefore the Skyward Town Council hereby appropriates for school purposes the education operating budget, the new sum of $47,125,168, resulting in the town of Scarborough raising the sum of $42,204,017, sorry, $42,204,017 as the local share for education operating budget. Be it further ordered that the final result of these changes produce a new total net budget of $62,674,112 resulting in a projected tax rate increase of 2.91%. Is there a second? Second. Comments, questions from Council? Council Rowan. Um, so um, I had been trying to point out for some time um, that some of the signs um, citing the increase in net education budget were causing confusion among the public. Um, some people expressed some skepticism. Um, some suggested that I was shaming or questioning the intelligence of the voters, and some suggested that I was exaggerating the impact. But I have actual proof in print, uh, and uh, um, I submit to you uh, an article from August 11th, 2017, uh, written by Ms. Sochin, and I, I sent her an email about it, and I haven't had a chance to talk to her about it, um, but I wanted to read um, a section. Um, on June 13th, 57% of residents voted against a proposed $47.4 million budget, which represented a 7.4% increase, excuse me, 7 .4 increase in spending for education. Um, I'd just like to point out that the, at the time, that, that proposal was a, a $47.4 million um, budget for fiscal year 2018. Um, it was $1.6 million more than the actual spend in 2017, which was $45.8 million, um, and that works out to a 3.5% increase. Um, so the number cited was more than double, um, and the number that she references, as was pointed out from the podium, is actually the net budget, and that is the uh, increase in spending plus the decrease in revenue, um, and it's not the increase in spending has been suggested. And I don't mean to, to suggest that uh, Ms. Sochin, um, Ms. Sochin or her editor are intentionally misleading us. Um, but it just illustrates my point um, that there's a lot of confusion around the numbers. Um, so what we're looking at tonight uh, with the budget that's before us with the $50,000 um, is an increase of $1.27 million from the spend in fiscal year 2017, um, which is 2.77% increase. Um, and that's a big, big difference. Um, it's about 40% of what's been represented on the, on the, um, on the blog that I read yesterday. Um, and again, uh, intentional or not, we're leaving the voters with the impression that spending is way, way up when that just isn't the case. Um, and so when we met on the 7th um, and we, we talked, I gave a long and tortured analysis of the things that have been cut and did my, you know, uh, ill-informed um, uh, analysis of what was a decrease in cost and what was a decrease in um, an actual cut. Um, and came up with uh, the analysis that, that, you know, our budget was $36,000 less than level service. Um, I was corrected uh, at the school board meeting the next night uh, to say that the budget that you're looking at here tonight 
is $209,000 below level service. So that means that were the school department to do exactly what they, they did last year, we would um, be $209,000 short, and we wouldn't be able to afford it given that the costs have gone up to do those things. Um, now, they, they've been very creative in the school department, and they've, they've changed priorities, and they moved positions around. Um, but I did want to point out, again, as I do every time I get an opportunity to speak about this budget, I just want to point out the things that we are cutting from the budget, and I appreciate the indulgence of time. Um, so one of the things that we cut was we, um, um, there was a desire and a need to increase um, the athletic trainer position, um, and they were going to have a, a halftime position. Um, that was removed uh, at first reading. Excuse me. That was removed from first reading before the first vote. Um, there was a large reduction in um, staff development, uh, which is training for our staff and our teachers. Um, we uh, reduced supply lines on uh, numerous occasions, which means either teachers are paying for it themselves, uh, those classes are doing without, or parents are uh, contributing those supplies. Um, we eliminated funding for field trips at the middle school. Um, there was a 10% uh, reduction in the, the textbook spend at the high school. Um, there was more professional development cut. Um, we eliminated one of the foster grandparent uh, positions at Eight Corners. Um, there was a retiring teacher at the high school uh, that uh, we did not backfill the position. Um, there was a limited enrollment in the Summer Reading Academy. Um, some of the, the furnishings that are being intended to be replaced on the replacement cycle have been delayed. Um, similarly, some of the vehicle uh, maintenance um, has also been delayed. Um, the, um, the position that um, Mr. Fangler referenced uh, in regard to the um, career and academic coordinator, that position was eliminated. Um, there was um, a reduction in the behavior specialist, which I uh, lamented last time. Um, there was a uh, reduction in the um, more curriculum, more professional development, um, and a reduction in time for a, a business secretary. So, at the same, so again, I'd like to point out that the the increase in um, the school spending in this budget is 1.27 million dollars. Now, meanwhile, uh, the town, as a whole, um, has our non-education revenues are up 650 thousand dollars. Our homestead tax exemption reimbursement is uh, $125,000. Uh, business equipment tax exemption is up $40,000. Our state municipal revenue sharing, uh, which is different than the, um, than the GPA that we get for the schools, is up $50,000. And we're still projecting a valuation growth of $49 million based on a 10-year average. Uh, we will find out before the next vote on September 5th what that actually came in at. But if you look at the $49 million, that will generate at the current projected tax rate, an additional $807,000 um, in new tax revenue. Taken together, this additional revenue totals $1.68 million, uh, which more than makes up for the um, $1.27 million. Uh, the, the school board is, excuse me, the school uh, spend is increased. That's it. Thank you. How's the St. Clair? <clears throat> um, I wasn't going to say anything, but I changed my mind. Um, I have to say a couple things, actually, three things. One, um, it's really frustrating to, um, as frustrating as it is for people to stand at the podium, it's almost as frustrating for us to sit here and not be able to um, respond to some of the things that you're saying. Um, it's extremely frustrating to hear that people think that we're unaccessible or that we're hiding things or that we're not there for you. Ask my kids how much they've seen me this summer. Um, I personally have held three round tables with other counselors on our own time, on our own dime, to help inform the public, to get your feedback to try to improve communications. This council itself has stepped up their communication process. So it's really frustrating when I see people come up and say that things, uh, things that about us that we're still unapproachable or that they're not getting the information they need. 
I'm on that. My cell phone is attached to my hip. I have constituents call me every day up until 10 o'clock at night. We answer the phone. That's our job. This is supposed to be a part-time, 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 part-time job. It's a full-time, it's a, more than a full-time job. And I don't, and I, and I love it. I mean, great, call me crazy, but I do. I love the residents of this town, even when they get up and say things that aren't so kind about me. Um, the sign ordinance, I, I, the only reason I'm going to speak to it in, in regards to the budget is that it's very frustrating to work on something that you think is um, an improvement to your town and then be told um, that you have, that you're intentionally doing it to silence voters. It's preposterous. I was never, I mean, especially people that know me would, I can't even, I can't believe that people would actually think that there would be people that would sit on this council that would, would create an ordinance to, to limit people from getting information. It, it's crazy. Call me crazy, that's fine, but I, that's, that was in no way, shape, or form the intention of the three people and the, and the person who sits as the, um, I'm sorry, um, alternate, alternate. alternate um, or the assistant town manager, um, or Jay Chase. That was not the intention of anyone. That came, actually started from complaints from residents who were upset about the signs that were being posted all over town. So that started out as a very innocent process. And if it got too convoluted, then okay, we have to step back and reevaluate. But that's why we have the process that we have in this town. But you have to give us a chance to have that process. And I understand that feelings. People, there's not a lot of trust right now. I get it. Trust me. I've been doing this for almost six years. I get it. I see it. And in some ways, I understand it. But reach out. Don't try to shame us. I, I personally have never shamed a single person in this town, ever. And I've been called some pretty bad things. And I've been shamed repeatedly. As far as cuts that they have made to the school budget, um, because I am going to support this budget tonight. Even, I mean, it's not perfect. It's not where I want to see um, our overall tax increase. But as I keep telling residents, we have an incredible new superintendent who came in and is working very hard with a very, very, very incredible school board. You gotta give her a chance. She walked into a landmine. It's her first year. I, I, I can only hope that next year, I know next year will be different. We're, we're already working with ideas from residents on how we're gonna make it different. Um, a, a girl yesterday, one of the cuts that was made to the, to the, um, to the athletic department is a con concussion specialist. I believe it was one of the things I heard, and she suffered a concussion yesterday, second day of preseason. And now she's out for three weeks, and there was nobody at the school. They had to go to the ER. So the, the, you may look at these, these cuts, and you may say they're, they're trivial cuts. They're token cuts. These are not token cuts. These are affecting our children. They're affecting my children. And so they might not be affecting your children. Maybe you don't have kids that go to school anymore. I do, and I'm living on an incredibly fixed income. I'm a single mother, so I understand that side of it. But I also am asking you, begging you, I'm not ashamed to say, to help us get this budget passed so that we can focus and move on and put this town back together and focus on next year. Please. That's it. Other counselors? Councilor Hayes. Yeah, I think <clears throat> Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, maybe take a little different direction. I, I think um, I'm going to support the budget tonight. Um, and part of that is because, and I, I think you've kind of heard it for the, for, from the podium. Um, this has really been a, a tough year for us. We have really worked hard to try to find a different way of working through the budget process. But I think it was said best. I don't think where we are right now is, is, is about the numbers. 50,000, as people have said, is not a lot of money. 
But what is important and what I did see and what I hope you'll hear a little bit in the conversation later tonight and some of the things we're talking about, and we are listening to what folks are saying. We've heard it tonight. People are really now looking forward to what are we going to do next year and the, year, the years after that. We have some challenging years coming. I think we are committed to trying to find a budget process. None of us want to be here again next year. So I really hope you'll work with us and, and try to get this budget passed so we can start forward looking to next year because as you've already heard, we know next year is going to be as equally as challenging as this year. It, 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 the numbers are going to be, and we need to have a different way we as a community can come together and make the choices we need to make as a community and what we need to do. Um, so again, I think it's more about the culture. I think it's more about how are we going to put a process in place that we can hear everybody's voice and make the, the decisions for the community that are the right decisions. So I'm hoping for your support to get this budget passed so we can move forward. And I hope we had a w joint workshop our last session where we talked about it. And I think everybody on the council at least is acknowledging that there's, we should look at maybe different ways that we can do it and get different input to get to a different place next year. And I take that as a real positive sign. So thank you. Uh, Council Chiazzo. Yeah, so I, I won't, I know we're pressed for time. I, I'll stick to the uh, initial comments I made at first reading uh, and I'll just simply say I know it's not a great budget <coughs> for anybody. Um, but let's put it aside and let's just do Let's get through this process and start the healing process with town, please. We're getting to the point now where we're starting to split hairs and, and we're getting past the point of really impacting the, the actual fiscal budget itself. So, you know, we, uh, to Councillor Hayes' point, um, you know, we have mechanisms in place to get feedback. We'll utilize those. We'll listen to people. We'll try and, 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 and improve the process. We should always be trying to do that. But let's stop being vindictive. Let's move forward and do the best thing that's right for the town. And let's pass this budget and, and so we can move on and start fixing the structural changes and not arguing over the financials of the, of the budget. Council Foley. Um, I'll try to be brief as well, uh, but I do have a few things to say. You know, I think we're all tired. <laughs> I think that's pretty clear. Um, and I think an argument could be made on either side that um, people got tired, they weren't paying attention, and they didn't show up. Um, 83 votes is a small margin. I uh, did not support the budget at first reading, the 50,000 uh, cut, because the way I looked at it was, does this help us or hurt us? And for me, if I have to go into the budget at this point and this level, then it should really be about how am I using this opportunity to set us up for a better cycle next year. Cutting $50,000 doesn't do it to me. Uh, so I would rather take the heat as a counselor and put the same budget back out to you and hope we can get those 83 people out to pass a budget because I do want to pass a budget, um, but it does hurt the schools and it, they aren't token cuts. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm going to support the budget tonight, though, because I said I reserved the option to change my mind because I want to support my fellow counselors in our work. I want the town to come together and start to heal. Um, but I do think we have to think about process improvement uh, and have real honest conversations about that. Um, you know, the, the analogy I was thinking of was I work in real estate. So uh, when you price a home and sometimes believe it or not, someone thinks their home might be worth more than you think it might be worth. Uh, and so they want to mm -hmm. price their home at a certain level. And 30 days goes by and they haven't sold their home and they look at you and go, well, geez, why isn't my home sold? Um, well, let's take a, a look back at the pricing and what we did to, uh, you know, <coughs> attract some buyers here. And they want to knock it down. Okay, well, okay, instead of 400000 we're going to go to 399 I'm not going to change their situation. And, and that's kind of how I feel about the 50,000. I don't feel like it's about the numbers anymore. Um, I will support it tonight, um, again, because I do want to <coughs> pass the budget. If the budget passes by 20, I'm not going to be, you know, well, no, I will be happy. Um, but I'm not going to be feeling great about it, I guess is what I'm saying. I, I'm really, uh, where other folks are, trying to think about what we can do differently mm -hmm. going forward. Uh, to bring more people together because I think this has to stop. Thanks. Councilor Donovan. You know, I, I really respect uh, Councilor Rowan. He gets into the weeds. He does his homework. 
he can tell you uh, what what is real and what's not real about this. And and I've tried to follow that lead sometimes, but I'm not going to tonight. Uh, this was a good budget from the, <laughs> this was a good budget from the beginning. It was unanimous uh, by the town council at the beginning, and we don't always agree. We have different uh, perspectives. It's a 2.8% 2 2 cost increase. Uh, that's all I'm going to say about it. I mean, that's, that's an extraordinarily strong budget to limit your cost increase to that. But that really doesn't speak to the importance of funding education, which I don't think we've heard enough about. And I didn't really, and I don't really have the words to, to explain how I feel about that. Uh, and I wanted advice from uh, a, a truly great leader, a truly great educator, uh, and given the news of the day, I wanted the words from somebody who had lived his life in Charlottesville, Virginia. And you know who I am quoting. An enlightened citizenry is indispensable for the proper functioning of a republic. Self-government is not possible unless the citizens are educated sufficiently to enable them to exercise oversight. It is therefore imperative that the nation see to it that a suitable education be provided for all its citizens. Thomas Jefferson. Thank you. Thank you. A um, couple items I wanted to bring up. One is uh, to explain at least for some comments that were made by the public. Um, there was a reference to budgeting around a particular position. I hope that the citizens understand that when we budget for a position, we budget um, all costs out, meaning that um, we budget for um, full-time employment based on 100% in the entire year, even though they may be actually hired you know, two months into the fiscal year or a half year, but we have to budget because you don't know the cycle in which you're hiring, unless it's intentional. And you're also, you're also budgeting for the maximum on the health <coughs> insurance side. So that $70,000 position, if I, understand, if I remember my numbers right, about 23000 of that is health insurance alone, which might not be the real cost, but we have to budget it because we don't know what the applicant's going to bring to the workforce and what they're going to require for health insurance. So keep in mind that the real position was $47,000 salary with a $23,000 <coughs> um, actual health insurance package, which might have been actually less. Um, that's what you have to do in budget. That's no different in business. Um, you do it on that basis. Again, unless you intentionally know that you're only going to fund it for a half a year or three quarters. We've done that on the town side, particularly on the fire department and police department hires. So I, I wanted people to understand that piece. The other piece is that, you know, even though this is about the school budget, I look at it from the total, the, the budget as a whole and the total impact of the town. For the last three years, the total increases have been 2.76%, 2.55, and 2.35. The average is 2.53, and the stated goal of the council has been at or below 3%. Um, this year we're at 2.91 and we're still consistent with that. And I think that if we sit back and stop looking at everything from a negative perspective and look at it from an added value perspective and look at what we have in this community, not just the greatness of our school system, but everything else that we have, our beaches, our public works, um, uh, how great public works is during the winter time and the snow plowing and the things that they add to the value of our life and the value of our property, I think that, generally speaking, that this, that this community can support a 2.91% increase in their taxes. The tough part of this job is balancing the needs of everyone and finding compromise. If everyone sat up here and had the opinion that I'm just going to stick to my own principles and I'm not willing to compromise and I'm not willing to talk about what we really need to do, we're never going to accomplish anything in this community. And I want to say thank you to the council members as well as to the school members because we've done a great job at finding that level of compromise over the years and we are getting better at it. We can always get better and we will and we'll find new ways of doing it. Um, I don't want that to anyone to believe that we've done anything wrong in the process up to this point. Um, I think if, any, if anything, the only criticism I have about the process is that I thought we had all agreed at the beginning of this uh, fiscal year and this fiscal pr uh, cycle that uh, we were not going to rely on the, t on the state providing us any funding um, and that we recognized we would be at minimal receivership, but then when the state came in and gave another $160 million, we all kind of ran frantically, or at least in our heads, uh, thinking that we were going to actually get more money. And lo and behold, even though the legislature said, well, we can't change the formula, they changed the formula, 
and we still get no more money, uh, or at least we're still at minimal receivership. So I hope that if anything, the one lesson we learn is that next year we go into this process knowing that we cannot rely on state educational funding from the state um, at, at the level and that we need to do better at um, long-term forecasting. When I say long-term, I'm talking three years forecasting and the other pieces that we've all said that we will um, you know, give some um, credibility to and some discussion. <coughs> I hope that the chair of the Finance Committee brings that up uh, very quickly because there are several recommendations and we've made it a commitment at the committee level to support that conversation. Um, I also wanted to mention around our own processes that I think Council St. Clair was generous in, in mentioning there was even more. We have become more open in the committee process. The Finance Committee of the Council and the Finance Committee of the Joint Council and, Town and School Board have been open forums in which citizens can come in and speak. I remember years in which those were completely closed and no one spoke at those committee meetings um, because of, that's just the way this town was back in those days. So, and by the way, even when people are there, people don't get up and speak. And so um, while we provide that opportunity, it also requires citizens to take the initiative and to be at those meetings and be willing to get up and talk to us, not simply write a blog that criticizes us. Because it isn't just about those who are being shamed and blamed because they don't support the schools. It's also about them shaming and blaming us when we do support the schools. And it's about trying to find that balance. And we're working, I think, very hard at doing that. I think we will find a compromise, and, and I think that this uh, current request is that compromise. So um, I think that we can move um, this forward. I hope that we learn some lessons and that we take those back and we change that process. So um, with that, if there's any other comments by councils? Oh. Yes. So on the, on the tail end of that and about the communications, we are actually having a budget roundtable at the end of the month. Um, it's, so I think it's the last Wednesday in August, or no, the 23rd, August 23rd. Um, it is a roundtable focused solely on the budget and the budget process it's for all residents of Scarborough. We've had three roundtables in the past that have been open to the public and they are just, those were just um, come and speak as you will. They were attended really well. Um, but this budget roundtable will be solely focused on just the budget and the process. So, and that's open to the public. Thank you. That's the case. Yeah, I've got, a, I've got a comment later on when we have another agenda item, but, but the chair is kind of open. I, I, we are going to have a finance committee meeting, a, a, a town finance committee meeting on the 31st at 6 p.m. Part of that agenda will be some of talking about some of the things that we have heard about. How can we start to look at some financial modeling, some debt modeling, and also start talking a little bit about the process and other things that we've talked about tonight. So we are taking steps to kind of take your comments back and try to blend it into something that gets us to a different place next year. So just thought I'd share that with everybody that's interested. Thank you. Thank you. Any other council comments? Not seeing any, but uh, not seeing any. It is a roll call vote. Um, and if the clerk would do the roll call. Councilor Chiazzo? Yes. Councilor Hayes? Yes. Councilor St. Clair? Yes. Councilor Foley? Yes. Councilor Rowan? Yes. Councilor Donovan? Yes. Chairman Bayback? Yes. And that is unanimous. Thank you. Um, given the crowd, I would like to maybe uh, recommend that we take a brief recess um, to allow those who don't wish to continue on. Um, so if we can all be I back here. Excuse me? <laughs> I said they all want to stay. Oh. Um, if we can all be back here in about three minutes, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming.
Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call the meeting back to order. You could all take your seats. Yeah, obviously, we have a pretty full agenda. Thank you. Moving on to new business, order number 17 075. It's the first reading of referred to the planning board on the proposed amendment to the second contract zoning agreement between the town of Scarborough and Bob Jettis and Lucinda Malbon. And if I could turn that over to. Um, Karen, sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Karen. It's a little late tonight, huh? I know better than that. Ms. Martin, thank you. Karen Martin with the Scarborough Economic Development Corporation. I'm here tonight bringing you a, a request from the owners of the Scarborough Day Spa to amend their exis existing contract zone. They are at uh, 311 Beechridge Road. Um, they've been operating a, a day spa there for uh, since the late 1990s. When they went in, they did have to do a contract zone. Um, the contract zone language in 1997 was extremely specific. And one of the things that the owners would like to do is they would like to add hair care to their services. Right now, they do skin and nails. Normally, you wouldn't think we'd need to do an amendment for something like that, but indeed, the language is very specific. So the purpose of this amendment tonight is to add hair care as a offered service at um, the Scarborough Day Spa. They are not doing any renovations. They're not doing any change of facilities. Um, the number of employees that are designated in the contract zone are still valid for them. Um, the only change is adding hair care to the services. Thank you. Any questions for Karen? Yes. Karen, <laughs> yeah, I think you already know what I'm going to say, don't you? <laughs> Do you? Um, how many times has she this, she been in front of us? Do you know? I mean, I think it was only a couple of years ago. I, I'm happy to see that it's not a change to the building and it's not a change right. to any of the other things because I probably I'm not. 100% sure I would support that at this point. Um, I remember Councillor Holbrook, she came, you know, before. This is a different I understand business? that. I do oh, understand okay. that. Um, I'm just saying it just, that it, I feel like every other year we're, we're, we're tweaking and making changes, and that's a good thing for a business. I mean, businesses have to grow, so I'm very understanding of that, but it's like as soon as I saw this on the agenda, it's like I could hear Jessica Holbrook in my ear saying, and I remember her saying as chair, okay, let's not do this. Let's get make sure we get this finalized because we don't want to have to keep making changes over and over again. Right. And just to be, I just want to make sure that, that we're clear. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking about a different business and a different um, property. Right. Um, this is a separate, completely, un totally unrelated, different business owners. Um, it was that. Lucinda's on Beach Ridge. Lucinda on Beach Ridge. Right. right. Yes. That's who we were talking about three years ago. Okay. I'm sorry. My memory was that it was the um, place on Pine Point. But I, I certainly get your. Yeah. I, I certainly understand. It just that. seemed like at the time there was so much confusion around it. And I remember the chair at the mm -hmm. time being concerned that if this was going to come back before us again. And I'm happy to see, my point is, I'm happy to see sure. that it's not anything to the existing building. And even though we always want to see growth in Scarborough. That is a highly residential area where mm -hmm. she is. Um, and so that was my concern when I first read it, and I'm happy to hear your update. That is not the situation. Co correct. They've got a 9.6 acre lot. Right. Um, they've been running this spa, um, again, since the 1990s um, continuously. Um, this is simply adding um, some services to the spa. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. This may not necessarily be for, for Ms. Martin, perhaps it's for the town manager or the town clerk. Was there a reason initially for the restriction in the contract zoning to be so specific? Was that What was the purpose behind that specificity? I think it was just the way it was proposed at the time. Okay. So there were no other issues or anything that, that no. caused that to be worded that way? Correct. Okay. Right. Our speculation was when we talked with the owner, our speculation was I think they may have pulled that off a state license, a mm -hmm. cosmetology license. Okay. Okay. And that may have been why it was so specific. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Not seeing any. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And is there anybody that would like to speak on the item? You're welcome to come to the podium from the public. No? Okay. Um, um, motion from council. So moved. Second. Second. 
any comments or questions? Comments? All right. Um, all those in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Moving on to order number 17-076, act on the request pursuant to Title 23 MRSA 3025 and to the requirements of Section 4 of Scarborough Street Acceptance Ordinance to accept the right of way on Honan Road associated with the Carrier Woods development as depicted in Planning Board approval documents dated July 17, 2017, and to authorize the town manager to sign any necessary documents. Before opening the public comments, anything the manager would like to... Angela Blanchett, town engineer, is here, and if you'll uh, permit her, she can provide just a quick introduction to the topic. Good evening. Good evening. Um, yes, it's just a short memo in your packet. It's uh, an existing dead end street on Muzzy Road, Honan. Um, recently, Rispera properties came through the planning board process, and we noticed that the end of Honan has in fact, the hammerhead, which we use obviously for snow plowing and emergency vehicle turnaround, but it, it's on an easement to the town. So uh, working with Rispera during that process, they were agreeable to transfer that um, fully over to the town. So that's what you're seeing in front of you. Also looking at um, an easement in addition to that so that we can push snow beyond that. Any questions for Steph? Yes. So uh, I, I know snow storage and snow removal is a kind of an EPA concern. We're mm -hmm. right up against the none such there. Are there any concerns or issues we need to be aware of for snow storage at the end of Honan Road? There's no um, natural resources within a like, designated buffer, I guess, from that area, and it's okay. just a, a typical Denon street. So no, there are no environmental concerns that we saw through that process. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? Not seeing any. Is there anybody from the public that would like to speak on the item? Not seeing any. Is there a motion from council? So moved. Second. Any comments or questions from council? Not seeing any. All in favor? That is unanimous. Thank you. Order number 17-077 is an act on the request to authorize the town manager to enter into a service agreement with the town of Kennebunk for vehicle maintenance and to sign any and all documents like to turn it over to the town manager before public comment. Yes, this will actually be the fourth community that we are providing some level of uh, vehicle equipment services. Mm -hmm. uh, as you may recall, we started this venture with the town of Old Virginia Beach and that relationship has gone very, very well. Since then, we've expanded it to include the towns of Hollis and Wells for their specialty fire apparatus. And that's what this uh, does as well with Kenny Bunk. It's really specific to their fire apparatus and we expect we can accomplish this within the existing staff. Um, we don't anticipate it having any undue burden on us and very pleased to, to bring it to you this evening. With that, I'd like to open a public comment. Is there anybody that would like to speak on the item? Not seeing any, we'll close the public comment. Is there a motion from council? So moved. Second. Any comments or questions? Council Chiazzo. So I, I apologize, Tom, I didn't hear mm -hmm. the, uh, will that require additional staff hire? It will not, no. Okay, okay. No. Um, and then the, the second question I had is uh, a little bit of clarity, if you could please, on attachment A. Um, <coughs> I believe it states um, Scarborough will maintain all associated items such as valves, piping, valves, piping, and electrical, uh, electrical switching systems as needed. And in the very next sentence, it says repair and preventative maintenance may be provided on a case-by-case -case basis. I was, I was a little confused with that. Uh, is it as needed, or is there a contract? Or uh, I'm, it really it is, I'm just reading it the wrong way. I don't know. Yeah, you'll see, I apologize for providing the strike through an underline version. That was not intended to happen. Um, essentially, it will be specific to the fire apparatus, but there is kind of the outside opportunity or need uh, for them to have other services. Okay. And we'll do those on a case by case basis, but it really is limited to fire apparatus. Okay. All right. Thank you. <coughs> Yeah, this is just a question directed to the town manager. So the other contracts, have we done sort of a return on investment or some type of financial, are they, are they a good deal for the town, bottom line? I, I believe so, and uh, I believe Mike Shaw has a, a, an analysis report that I can provide to finance if that is the right venue or to the full mm -hmm. council. But um, yes, he would certainly not be recommending us uh, to, to, to bring on another community yeah, yeah. if it was not a successful venture. We know for a fact, um, we're making um, something in the order of 12 to 15% profit, if you will, uh, based on the hourly rate that we charge. 
Uh, I just know sometimes there is unanticipated sort of consequences of things. So if I've had great experience, that, that really was my no, question. No, our biggest concern was keeping up with the workflow, mm -hmm. and we've been able to regulate that such that we're, we can do it without impacting uh, our first priority, which is taking care of our equipment and the schools. Great. Thank you. Uh, Councilor St. Clair. Just a quick question, Tom. Mm -hmm. um, the, the only, after reading through it, the only concern I had was, is it standard, was it standard in our other agreements that that it's a six month for termination, so they can notify us six months. It just seems six months seems like a long time if there is a potential problem that arises. We'd have to continue to service them for that period of time. Yeah, that's been a consistent it provision okay. in all of them. Okay. I, I would note the term, I'm trying to line these all up to line up with the fiscal year. Good. So this initial term will take us from September 1st to the end of the fiscal year. Okay. And then they can be considered and re renewed at that point. Okay, so you're comfortable with the six months? At this point, it's certainly not been an issue, and it's consistent with the other three in place. Okay, great, thank you. Any other council comments, Council Rowan? So, just a, just a question. So, um, I assume at the end of the term, then we can reevaluate the the rate and if there's a increase necessary. Yeah, I believe we actually have a built in. We'll, uh, in. we'll advise them at, at a certain point of the year. Um, we advise them what the rate will be. They'll make mm -hmm. a decision whether they want to continue it. Sure. Yeah. Any other comments? Not seeing any, all those in favor? And that is unanimous, thank, thank you. you. Next item is order number 17-078. It's an act to submit the referendum question to construct and equip a new public safety building to the November 7, 2017 election. Before public comment, I'd like the manager to provide an overview. Certainly, we've prepared a referendum question, a ballot question, if you will. Uh, this is consistent with the uh, requirements of state law in terms of uh, essentially providing a fiscal note associated with what the borrowing uh, would entail. Uh, that fiscal note includes uh, advising the public what our current debt load is or will be at the time the vote is, is uh, in front of them. Um, the anticipated, uh, of course, issue, uh, the amount of this issue, bond issue and the related interest as well. Uh, you'll note in this calculation we've also included a couple of other funding sources um, that bring us to the point of identifying what that total need to borrow is. Um, so we start with a overall projected budget of $21,548,095 and that was reviewed with you in workshop. Uh, I believe there are members of the ad hoc committee here tonight and can certainly speak to that in better detail. Uh, we do have the existing reserve funds of about 625000 actually slightly more than that, but I, I want to be conservative, that I propose that we direct toward this project. And we're also, as part of this process, uh, the ad hoc committee has recommended the highest and best uses to sell the existing facility and to use the proceeds of that sale uh, towards this new project. And we have conservatively um, carried a number of about $1.4 million dollars for that. That brings us to the total borrowing need of $19.5 million. Um, there's some other materials that were provided, uh, including the final report, um, some commentary from the committee's perspective in terms of what they intend to do between now and uh, November 7, um, and of course the budget as well. Uh, again, there are members here that can certainly speak to the particulars of this project um, better than I, but uh, I'll do my best to answer your questions. Thank you. Any, um, so with that, I'd like to open up public comment. Is there anybody in the public that would like to speak on this item? Not seeing any, I'll close the public comment. Is there a motion from Council? So moved. Second. Comments and questions, Council Chiazzo? <coughs> so um, I'm obviously support the project, hands down. It's, it's clear need here. I'm, I'm a little concerned about the compressed time schedule between now and November. Um, more specifically because we've also got comprehensive planning. We're asking the public to do a lot of stuff with that. And then in addition to the, the very aggressive outreach, which I think is important and necessary of this committee, I'm just concerned that we, we might be running into a little bit of, of, uh, of uh, fatigue, if you will, from the public of all this involvement. So the question I would have uh, to the manager, if I could, if, if it doesn't make the November ballot, what's the next What's the next possibility and what does that do to the, to the project overall? Well, the next possibility, unless there's a special election that you would call for this purpose or another purpose, would be the June primary. And I think uh, speaking, uh, and many of us 
uh, were part of a conversation, and certainly Councillors uh, yeah. St. Clair and Hayes can speak to it. Uh, I think there's a concern that the momentum will be lost, and we'll have to rebuild that. Uh, and frankly, uh, there, there can be some challenging items on that June ballot, and it's probably best to advance this. The, the dynamics in the community are not likely to change significantly between now and, and June. Uh, so I think it was the collective opinion that this is the best time to move it forward uh, right now. Can I address okay, that I also? Oh, Clare? do you want me to? You want to go first? Me? <laughs> okay. um, we actually this was a that was actually a concern that I had. We held a we actually held a meeting with the chiefs um, and Kevin Freeman and the town manager um, to talk about whether it was a good plan to put this on the November ballot or not, um, because I shared those very similar concerns. Um, and um, after speaking with the chiefs and with Kevin, um, it was very obvious that it does, should be on that November 4th ballot. There's actually a lot of reasons why. Um, uh, construction costs, percentage rates, interest rates. Yep. Uh, I mean, it, there's a slew of things um, having to do also with the council committee members themselves. Um, that committee is made up of an incredible group of people that have a wealth of knowledge, and they felt very strongly that this should be on that ballot because of time frames. Um, not so much needing to be out of the existing building because quite frankly these guys have been living that way for quite a while. Um, but more having to do with construction of the new building, um, ground, I mean there was, there was a, a huge long list of reasons why mm -hmm. we really need to get this going and, and moved. I mean ideally, obviously coming off of, um, uh, you know, the the, the losses at the election, I mean, those are, that doesn't give everyone a warm, fuzzy feeling, but I don't think, and we've talked about this, I don't think that this town isn't willing to spend the money. I think there are other issues at play, and unfortunately, the schools have been taking the hit for that. Um, but I was, I did go into it very concerned. Um, and was almost pushing to, to move it to June and came out of that meeting um, after being after meeting with the chiefs and Kevin feeling extremely strongly about getting this on that ballot. Councilor Rowan. Uh, so we heard um, uh, Carol Rancourt speak from the uh, podium at general comment um, at the beginning of the meeting. Um, and I just wanted to, to <coughs> convey the uh, sentiment of the uh, 55 plus advisory committee um, when this was discussed yesterday morning, um, there was a, um, a very strong feeling um, that they would really like to see that building um, serve as an interim um, senior center or community center. Um, there's um, just, I uh, um, enjoy spending time with that committee because I learn a lot about the town history that mm -hmm. happened before I moved here. Um, and uh, uh, Bud Henson was present, Hanson was present, and he was, uh, filling me in on what happened in 2001. Right. Uh, and uh, at the time, there was a referendum question uh, on the table. Um, I think it was, he said it was a 5.7, and I'm relaying secondhand inform yeah. information, but what? he said in 2001, we had a vote for a $5.7 million senior center. Um, uh, Carol uh, interjected that, you know, and at the time of the vote, we, there was also discussion about maybe a Y was going to come to town. Mm -hmm. um, I think there was something about Piper Shore, but I'm, I missed a little bit of it, uh, and uh, um, uh, so the, the net is um, that, I, I guess, can, could we speak to the suitability of the site if it were to be reused, because the, the um, you know, if we were to hold on to the asset, we could always sell it later. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, other thoughts that I had was maybe we could split the question to say, hey, you know, turn it into two questions on the ballot to say the, the funds and then would you mm -hmm. sell, sell the building and use the proceeds for it? Um, it also, it, you know, my understanding is this is a single read, so we have to, whatever we mm -hmm. do, we've got to take action tonight. I assume there's some kind of calendar that we would be working under to get onto the November ballot. So I apologize mm -hmm. for the lateness and, and my lack of, um, of footwork since yesterday morning. But Mr. Um, can I address that? That's several questions all at once. I can, I can address your, uh, and I'm probably stepping on your toes again. Um, uh, I know that um, Angela Blanchett actually looked at, I believe, and I don't want to speak for you, or maybe it wasn't you, okay. Um, uh, where the police station is centered now is extreme, part of the reason we need to move is it's extremely difficult <coughs> to access. 
Um, so one of the reasons why there was a major concern about putting any kind of senior facility in that or any kind of facility, town facility in that building was because of access. Um, even with uh, lights and sirens, our vehicles have a difficult time sometimes getting into um, Route 1 through Route 1 traffic. Um, so talking about putting a senior center in there was a concern um, because of traffic. Two, um, I think they took what they believed would a senior center would require and they tried to basically put it on top of, am I right? Yeah, on top of the existing building and it just was, number one, there's not enough parking. So it was a no-go. Um, there wasn't enough parking, there wasn't enough space in the building that outfit alone would be um, probably more than what the building would be worth. Um, for us to outfit it for a senior center. Um, so they actually did really try to do that because obviously we want that. Um, so that building was deemed not feasible um, to be used for a senior center. And then the, the reason, there's a lot more reasons behind it and I'm, I can get you the paperwork for it if you'd like to share that with that group. Um, I would be hesitant, and I don't want to speak for anybody else, but I would be hesitant to, to um, break off any of that question because I think then you're you're messing with the PD fire station and it starts not that voters get confused but you really have to have a very it's very um, direct what you have to have on a ballot so I'm not exactly sure how we would be able to to word that um, as far as using the money from the sale towards a senior center I, I don't know how that would work so but I do know that there was a very strong effort made to try to put a senior center in that building. So if, if I could, I'd just like to expand. So the, the thought there was this would be a, an interim and it, we'd be better off than we are today. Like understanding this is not an ideal space. Mm -hmm. uh, we wouldn't necessarily want to invest a lot of money into um, you know, retrofitting the building toward a permanent senior center, mm -hmm. uh, which might have been what the analysis was. Um, it was more just a recognition of, you know, there were problems with um, Wentworth, one of which being park, parking in space and yeah. distance for walking. Um, at Martin's Point, there's also, there's much less parking than, than would be at the fire station. There's also um, a, a space limitation. I mean, they really, it's been incredibly successful yeah. to have Martin's Point and we're so appreciative for what they're offering, um, but it's been um, a victim of its own success mm. in that Wednesdays they they've got 60 people coming to the right. to the lunch on Wednesday and they had to turn away a busload from the from the veteran center because they just couldn't accommodate them. And the um, only real red flag I would see, and Tom obviously Sean probably can speak better to this, um, if you were to use a building from my construction experience in the interim, it, you run into insurance issues, um, and I don't know how that would I don't know how that would actually work. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I can't really, I, it would be hard for me to address that. You'd have to get that from Tom and Sean, I think. Uh, I will say the ad hoc committee, one of the tasks given to them was to evaluate the current facility and make recommendations, with, which they have, and that's what's yeah. before you. Uh, there was a subcommittee. Uh, I participated somewhat. Judy Roy was on it, Kevin Freeman and Karen Martin and myself, I think. Uh, that committee looked at the long-range facility plan and didn't limit their consideration to a senior center. They looked at what are the future needs and can this building and or site accommodate any of those? And to add a little clarity to Councilor St. Clair's point, I don't recall that a senior center specifically was considered, but we're looking at a community center, which presumably a Thank portion you. of which would cater to the senior community as well. Uh, and in that analysis, it was very clear that that site was not suitable for a facility a community this size would require. Uh, and I think it was the wisdom and thought of the committee that uh, it's really important to show commitment to the taxpayers uh, that we're doing whatever we can to get the building cost down um, and to, to be responsible about the budget. I guess the final point in terms of timing, uh, it is time sensitive in that if we wish to have this on the November ballot, I would say at your next uh, council meeting would be the absolute drop dead date and I would cut his concurring. So there would be a potential of delaying this, I, I hate to even mention it, but um, it cannot go past your next meeting uh, if you wish to have a question of any sort on the November ballot. Councilor Donovan. Uh, 
I support this strongly. Uh, the presentation made the case very clearly that the building is needed. Uh, that it was also we we tested uh, the committee uh, on uh, affordability and uh, cost efficiency, and I think we were satisfied with their answers. Um, splitting the question or senior center, I think that case had to be made to the committee. We're way beyond that at, at this point, and uh, and so I uh, I wouldn't support that. I really want to uh, say thank you to the committee itself, the consultants, the two chiefs. They really did an excellent job. It was, it was so professionally done. Kevin Freeman, as always, just did a wonderful job of providing that service to the community. Uh, I do have a concern about any delay. Uh, interest rates are going to be going up. Uh, the cost of construction uh, seems to be also going up, and so uh, I think any delay is going to cost the town on this. So I think uh, the November ballot seems appropriate. Councilor Foley. Um, I would just say really quickly, um, I do support this overall. I wouldn't be opposed to waiting one more meeting if it meant Council Rowan could get some questions answered that he needs answered. Uh, but I, I strongly believe it's got to be on a November ballot um, versus a June ballot because that's where we'll get a, a much truer uh, also sense from the community and voice um, as bad or good as we might think our school budgets uh, bring voters out it's still not it doesn't come it pales in comparison to November but I would wait a week if you wanted What's the uh, so I, I think I want to preference all of my comments to say that I, I also really strongly support this I think that we should move ahead and move ahead in, in November um, and I would I would follow up with uh, from the town manager's comment a, a moment ago of the next meeting being the, the drop dead date. Uh, would anyone see harm in waiting those two weeks just to to, to explore a little bit further? And I, I really apologize for the lateness of this request coming in. I, I, so the question is, do, would that would that do harm to the process if we were to table this until our next meeting? No, I mean, I, it's a function of the timing it through election laws. Um, that deci a decision would have to be made at your next meeting. Um, there is that opportunity. Who would do the evaluation I, I, beyond I, where we I are? I think I'd just like to, I think I'd just like to ask the question and, and make sure that, that, um, the, that all of the options were considered for, for that use. We do have a number of the key actors here with us this evening. Is it, that, yeah. that might, is it a that value might to help. have anyone? I think it, I think it might be. A, if anyone can add some color to that. What are you, what are you asking for? So, I, what I, so specifically, um, the, the very strong sentiment of that group of people was that um, they would like to see um, an interim facility at that location rather than the, uh, <coughs> the um, building sold and the funds used toward the project. Um, and so, so I guess what I'd like to explore is one: is that feasible? Two: is it possible to put that out of the second question um, on the ballot? Well, I mean, I think I answered. Mm -hmm. so I, no, I appreciate, it, but okay. I, what I, I understand that I'm, I'm coming up here at, without giving anyone advance notice and Thank putting you on chief. the spot, and I and I appreciate trying yeah. to add some color. I'd just like to push back and challenge that a little bit, if, if people will indulge it. I could wait a second. Could I ask the chief, um, either one or both, if they could come up and maybe? at any perspective that might help the counselor with his question? <coughs> I guess for my own, could I ask a question first? <laughs> 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 I understand, understand this, the, what uh, the former counselor said, because I didn't, this was the first I'd heard of it. Are they looking for a place to have their once a month suppers? once a week um, events similar to what they're doing at Martin's Point? Uh, yeah, so the, so the idea would be that a larger space that could accommodate right. some of the, the right. growing needs, but right. yeah, exa right. that's exactly it. And I guess my response to that is the, the first issue is we certainly can't move out of the old facility until a new one's built, so there's, right. there isn't an interim during construction period when right. that would work. Completely understood. And then the new facility does envision a hundred person mm -hmm meeting room that is also going to be community space when it's not being used for training and public meetings. So 
it's not outside of the realm of possibilities that there could be a recurring weekly luncheon place that would have seating for 100 people within the new facility to meet that interim need until there is another facility done, which would eliminate having to heat, maintain, and do all the other mm -hmm. things that would go forward with keeping the old facility going. Is that That's a great point. Make sense? Yeah, I think that's fair, and I also think that uh, in the interim, we could certainly explore whether we had the capability of, uh, of entertaining those folks uh, in the current space until something different happens. Um, my concerns are, and it's already been alluded to, but my concerns really are the access because it's, uh, it's, it's really, really difficult uh, mm -hmm. to get in and out of that uh, lot. And I would be concerned about seniors trying to trying to navigate that. Um, it's very difficult for our officers that do it every day, and for those folks coming in and out that that aren't used to it, um, I would be concerned about that. I'd also be concerned about um, the we've deferred maintenance on this building for a long time now, uh, back in 2007-8 when we were first starting to explore this. And we have not really spent any money on that building since then. And there are some real uh, deficiencies that uh, I think would need to be addressed if we were going to have folks in there. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Foley. Um, so just quickly, the other thing that occurred to me as the conversation was taking place is that sometimes that two-week time period, it's not just about us feeling more comfortable about but the groups that were liaisons too. So if it could give Council Rowan the opportunity to explain to or that senior group to understand better why it may not be a good uh, interim piece that might be helpful too and it's still as long as it wouldn't jeopardize our uh, you know getting on the November ballot I, I would support the two week time period because um, I think that communication piece and getting people to understand why we make a decision is equally important. That's all. So before we go continue any more questions for the chiefs? Thank you gentlemen. Thank, Thank you. Much. Um, so I, I wanted to at least um, add a comment about this. So very uh, supportive of moving this forward. Um, I think that if um, we need a couple of weeks to make others comfortable, I'm fine with that as long as we do make a, a decision, have a decision by the next meeting, and would be happy to entertain a tabling motion um, after everyone's had a chance to speak. I actually think, uh, Councillor Rowan, that we, even as it is currently drafted, we can still achieve the concerns or address the concerns that they have by two things. One is that if we involve the community services director's department in helping them identify an alternative location, I believe they're primarily uh, functioning on their own, but maybe we can offer that services that would have to go through Tom and his staff to get approval and kind of get help. Second is that if you think about the timeline, um, so they're going to start construction. It's going to take, um, and I'm, I don't know, maybe a year to build it. So it's not like they're automatically going to vacate the building and then it's going to be something sitting there empty. Um, but I think that the manager through the process can negotiate with a sale, um, a temporary use or a lease back uh, for a short period of time since it's only an interim solution. What we're doing is you're just simply delaying the sale of the property or at least the ownership, taking ownership of the property. It doesn't impact what is being requested here. It's more of a procedural or process issue that the manager would have to take into consideration when he accepts a bid for the sale of it and when we would transfer it and how that would happen, where we could still probably use that on an interim basis. Um, I think that, you know, I would be a little concerned about, definitely about access. Um, I just have the other day, I was going down Route 1. If it wasn't for me stopping to let the chief out of the driveway to be able to take a left-hand turn, nobody else would have stopped. <laughs> um, and, it has to be, and it's going to be no different with the seniors when they're trying to get out of um, all of those roads going left and right. So I do have an access issue for anybody there. Um, but then also even the condition of the building, if you listen to the presentation, um, and, and I don't want anyone to be offended, but with seniors and health issues and um, the quality of air control and everything else that's in there, I'd be a little nervous. Um, the whole purpose of us moving our staff now is because of those concerns. Why would we then put our seniors in there? So, um, but I think there's an interim solution that can be uh, negotiated as part of the sale. Council Chiazzo? Yeah, so I guess, you know, I, 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 hear, the, I hear the comment and the need to, to, to acknowledge their concerns, but at this point, I mean, unless they're going to, you know, come before the committee and plead their case as to why they think 
it's the right thing to do. It sounds like the committee's already explored it, and I don't know what that extra two weeks is going to do other than potentially put us in a tight restriction. I don't know how that's going to affect our deci ultimate decision. Um, if it's just a question of it's got to go out of the bond, if we're going to count 1.4 million towards the, the bond number, we have to be clear about that. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I guess my question would be, I don't know what we hope to accomplish with that. If it's just communicating and, and telling them why we're doing it, I think we could accomplish that and still get the bond out because it's not going to change right. our decision, if you know what I mean. I, I don't think, but that's just that's, that's just me. I, I, I can, if, if the will of council is the table, I can I can table, but I just wonder what we're going to accomplish with that. Council Donovan. Yeah, I think the explanation from the uh, uh, two chiefs that there will be 100 seat space available is something that was not known. And that as an explanation would, I think, quite sad it because it's going to be first class space. It'll be, it'll be very suitable for them. And as soon as the sp space is available, and therefore we can accomplish exactly what uh, uh, Council Rowan's suggesting uh, uh, with better space. So uh, I would say that at this point, the explanation has been made. It's a good one and would be accepted by that or that committee. It just may be of interest to council. I've been thinking, should this get on the ballot and pass in November, I believe I would be before you fairly quickly to get authorization to sell, market and sell that building, really so we can get some certainty around what its value is. That will afford an opportunity for some conversation. If it's possible with the right buyer, we can have a lease back provision or delay that acquisition. So there's there's still opportunity. And I I would intend to move very quickly in that regard, obviously respecting what our needs will be in the meantime. But uh, getting certainty around that number is going to be pretty important to us. Can, can I ask a procedural question? Yes. So uh, a table <coughs> motion would would need majority support, correct? Right? Uh, then can I move that we that we table for two weeks? I, I and I totally take the feedback of uh, that, that it sounds pretty infeasible. I just would like the opportunity to go back and and express what I learned tonight to that group and make sure that they're still um, um, that they're that they are supportive of the options that were laid out. I think they're all wonderful. I love the idea of using the the hundred space. I think the building might not be completely feasible toward toward reuse. Certainly the location. The, the maintenance, the heating, um, all those things I think are, are strong arguments for um, for why this is probably not the best idea, but if it's not harmful, uh, I'd really just appreciate the opportunity to have some time, and I do sincerely apologize for making the request. But. I'll second it. So, yep, so the motion and the second is to table order number 17-078 to the September 6th meeting. It's been uh, moved and seconded. It is not debatable. All those in favor? All those opposed? Uh, six to one, thank you. Order number 17-079, act regarding tax commitment. If a third school budget validation vote fails, and before public comment, I'll turn it over to the manager for uh, an explanation. You may recall during your last uh, workshop for your last regular meeting, uh, there was some conversation. This issue came up um, kind of in the context of what do we do in the event of a failed vote. Uh, it does begin to present some operational challenges from a cash flow perspective. And essentially, the two options are uh, to borrow money to get us to a point in the future uh, if we're not able to actually issue tax bills and receive tax revenue. Or there is uh, statutory language that allows for us to go to commitment, tax commitment, based on uh, the last approved budget by this body. So in this case, uh, it would be the one that you just approved this evening. Uh, that will enable us to stay on our normal schedule and we would continue in the event of a failed vote to keep working until we ultimately get a voter validated school budget. But in the meantime, we will have issued tax bills and uh, move forward with the operational end of things. So this is kind of the contingency plan. Um, I think we all hope that this doesn't need to be employed, but it would be great to have it in place so we know we have a path forward. Um, with that, is there any public comment? <coughs> Not seeing any, we'll close public comment. Is there a motion from the council? So moved. Second. Comments and questions? Council Chiazzo. Yeah, I think we covered it pretty well in the, in the work budget workshop. Um, I, I think it's the, it's the financially responsible thing to do for the town. And I, you know, I appreciate the Bernstein <coughs> Shore memorandum in there as well, just kind of validating that we are within the purview to do that. And I think it's, it, it's the least 
we all hope for the best, but we have to plan for the worst, and I think this puts the town in the best position to accommodate whichever the outcome is. If the outcome <coughs> is positive, then uh, we move forward. Uh, if the outcome fails, we still can move forward uh, responsibly, and we still have more time to debate the merits of a further budget if we have to. So I, I fully support the measure. Councilor Rowan. Um, so um, I'm also supportive. I think it's the, the prudent thing to do. Um, the only thing that I'm concerned about is that um, when I read it, it looks like we're tying our hands in that um, if we have to go out for a rent for them a fourth time, um, that we would necessarily be making cuts to the budget in order to do that. Um, and I think that um, that essentially we're, we're tying our hands. I think that the, the, um, the, there is a sentiment in town um, where I'm hearing a, a sentiment in town from a certain population that think that the school budget is, is way too high. Um, and if we are going to be going after yes votes, I think we need to at least consider um, that we need to go after the, the two low voters on our next round. Um, I think that, you know, you, we heard um, Ms. Richter um, from the podium, Ms. Richter from the podium tonight um, give the definition of insanity that's often attributed to Albert Einstein, and he may or may not have said um, that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over. Um, but it's something to consider. And, and what I would suggest is that perhaps we could amend this to include um, a provision that, that, that um, would also accommodate the fact that we might have to increase um, and therefore the commitment would already be out. So the idea would be that we would cover that increase out of fund balance and then replenish it in fiscal year 2019 with a surcharge. I don't know if that's feasible. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm having I didn't trouble following your so, logic. So when I read... Um, you raised too much money, right? right? So, yeah, when I read this, it says that in the circumstance that, that uh, we raised too much money because in the, in, uh, we, the, the budget fails, therefore we'd have to go out to a, a fourth vote Right. But we've already committed based on this budget. Um, and this, this accommodates the scenario that we would say, okay, well, therefore we have to cut the budget again. Um, and um, so the commitment would be too high. We'd be raising too much money, and therefore we would be, um, it accommodates that scenario. What, what I don't see is, is the scenario of we put the commitment in place in September. We have another vote in October, but that vote is for a larger budget. Um, and... Uh, uh, and therefore, what what happens? Because I don't I don't see that in in the reading. And so I was suggesting some possible language, something that we might be able to do. Um, and I'm I guess in the form of a question to the to the manager of whether or not that's feasible. I can't answer that. I mean, we're, we're, this is uncharted territory. I'm not aware that any community in Maine has found themselves in this circumstance. That's what our attorneys are saying. So I, I'm not in a position to give you any advice with how to modify this language tonight. Mr. Chair. Yes, sorry. Oh, thank thinking. Yeah, uh, I think hmm. Councillor Rowan was uh, theorizing that the budget might go up. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and could we, but I think that is such an exceedingly remote condition that to have the certainty of knowing that we can pay our bills uh, by uh, having the assessor set the tax rate is far more important here. Uh, given that the chances are if we had a fourth referendum, it would be a lower budget, not a higher budget. But it certainly wouldn't be a large change either way. So I would, I'd be inclined to not try to take care of that theoretical contingency. Councilor Rowan. So I, I guess my response would be I, I agree with uh, Councilor Donovan, and we can cross the bridge, and if we need to do something, we can figure that out. True. At, at a later date, this council this controls higher hand. use of fund balance. So, if you find yourself needing and wanting to use fund balance for a particular purpose, you can choose to do that at any point. Great. Uh, we, don't, we don't need to change it. Now. I support this. Councilor Hayes. Yeah, just a quick comment. I, I, I support setting it now and doing it because the, the other alternative, which is borrowing money, which we did talk about, mm. that has some consequences too. I mean, there's interest costs that won't be insignificant. To um, it could possibly impact bond rating numbers, mm -hmm. and as we talk about the new fire station, um, that could have a real impact. So I think it's the prudent thing. I totally agree; it's a prudent thing to do. That's our backup plan. Makes a lot of sense. So I support it. Other comments? I just want to mention. Um, so 
The only concern I have is um, we need to be prepared um, for that what if, and that is because if we set this rate, which I totally agree with, and then it fails and we come back and we have um, then have to do another reduction, um, the citizens receiving tax bills will be confused and some will be upset the fact, by the fact that they have overpaid and will have some expectation of either a refund in the current year or some process in which they can access that. Now, most of them um, might only have a very small impact and it might not be that significant, but there are some properties when you take a penny and times it by the value mm -hmm. and put it through that calculation for some, that those are pretty large overpayments and I just want staff and us to be prepared to have that conversation about what we're going to do in that case. Now, I hope that everyone votes for this budget um, and this is a precautionary tale um, but I want us to be acknowledging, acknowledging today that we will need to have something in place to meet that demand if something should happen. So yeah. let me be very clear. State law does not allow a community to commit taxes more than once. So right. we'll do it once. Yep. And this uh, paragraph three was added really to add clarity for you and for the public that in the event of that circumstance, what would we do with the extra money we're raising by taxes that don't need to fund operations? And the effect of that is it goes to fund balance. With that, anybody else? Not seeing any, all those in favor? And that is unanimous, thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on, order number 17-080, act to create an ad hoc budget advisory committee um, before public comment. Um, would Councilor Foley like to make any introductions since she is the author of the resolution? Yes. Um, are you gonna read the whole piece or do I need to read the whole piece? Yeah, um, it, it, um, I wouldn't read the whole piece now because you'll do that as part of the motion. Okay. So if you can just summarize it for the public because so they can speak to it. Okay. Uh, so uh, if everyone, anyone's ever, ever came to my classroom when I was a teacher or came to my home office, now I have quotations all over the place. It's uh, something that I just get inspired by daily and this one struck me as appropriate for uh, this particular uh, proposal. Um, to get where you want to be, sometimes you have to be willing to do something you are afraid to do and do something that you've never done. Don't let those fears get in the way of your, your potential. Um, so it was kind of in the spirit of that quote that I felt putting this resolution, resolution into uh, action was important. Um, and while I know it caught some of my fellow counselors and some other folks off guard in terms of timing, I also felt it was prudent to uh, demonstrate a willingness by the council that, you know, it's not just lip service, we are hearing people and we are take, taking action and willing to take action to make some changes um, to the way we do business. I do think there's been continual improvement all along. Um, so the basic crux of, of the resolution and proposal is to put together um, uh, an ad hoc advisory committee uh, that would be made up of council members, school board members, members of the public that represented uh, as a diverse a group as we can get, folks who are <coughs> part of the tax group, if, if you will, and folks that may be part of a schools group, if you will, um, and really try to get everybody working in the same direction um, so that next year, uh, even though we'll still have some differences, um, we may be able to see each other uh, uh, in a little bit more common ground. So that's really my goal. Um, I also just wanted to uh, personally have a more active role and voice in the process. Um, so I think that's it. And you're going to read this piece and then start the conversation or how do you? Well, I'm going to open up to public oh, comment. Yes. Um, is there anybody from the public though would like to speak on this item? Larry Hartwell, 9 Puritan Drive. I have no prepared remarks for this, but I think uh, certainly a dialogue is certainly better than a monologue and, and uh, you don't get changed without talking to one another. So I think the concept is good and we ought to give it a try. Anybody else that would like to speak? Hi, Sarah Mullen, 55 Gunstock Road. Um, could, and I know this is not supposed to be a dialogue, but I'm just going to do this anyway. Could someone explain how this would actually, like, what that means, ad hoc advisory council or committee, whatever it's called, and how that would work in the budget process in the future if it passes? Thanks. 
Absolutely. Um, so I can at least address how the council rules uh, deal with ad hoc, um, and then it kind of depends on what happens next with this. But council rules indicate that an ad hoc committee can be created by the council in which members are named to, to that committee, and that each of the ad hoc committees then have a um, time-specific uh, range. So there will be a start date and an end date um, included in that, and then if they need to be extended, just as we did recently regarding the um, uh, public safety building, um, that can actually then be extended at a later date if there needs to be additional work. Um, the premise of this, um, uh, if I can summarize for the counselor, is that um, the committee will be charged um, with a purpose that outlines um, establishing baseline of facts and information. Um, it's been suggested that in the membership that there will be two town counselors uh, representing the Finance and Communications Committee, one school board member, preferably from the School Finance Committee, one member of Save Our Schools Group, one member of Smart Taxes Group, and four additional members to be selected through an open application process. Um, then the other pieces are more formalities about quorums and official meetings and minutes and kind of uh, things that need to be included as part of that. Um, and then that committee would then um, um, have its work before it uh, based upon what's in the purpose statement. There are five bullets within the purpose state statement. Um, it establishes a baseline of facts regarding the cost associated with the delivery of current and historical service levels by benchmarking Scarborough's cost to those in other communities. Identify common goals among all Scarborough stakeholders. Consider ways to improve the current budget process. Develop suggested outreach and communication strategies. Provide ongoing feedback and support to the joint finance committee throughout the budget process. Um, so those are the five charges and pur purpose statements that are in there. Do I have to say my name again? No. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I'm a stickler for rules. Um, <laughs> so, f one other procedural question: Is this what's going to vote? You're voting now, and then it's happening, or you're voting now to then consider it later? It seems. I will. And this, I guess, is just a comment. As someone who's been very involved in this, it sounds like specific groups are mentioned, and they're not necessarily named properly, uh, perhaps, and it would be nice to be able to, as a member of one of the groups that I think was intended to be included there, it would be nice for us to be able to give feedback as a group um, thoughtfully about what I think, and I, speaking just for myself, I do think dialogue is a great idea, but there, I don't think right now I can speak very well about uh, whether this is a good idea, specifically about like how it's been outlined beyond yes, agreed, dialogue's a good idea. So is, is there a way to have an opportunity to think about it and then provide comment beyond just right this minute? And I know I'm not supposed yep. to ask you questions. So. No, nope. um, um, it's been a long night. Um, to, uh, our action is to approve the committee. So um, if we take this up and we vote yes, it is, the committee will be formed based on the, the membership that was listed. So our action tonight now. It, Can I just it, add one thing? Yes. Part of, some of your questions may be answered through our conversation, I'm right. guessing, because um, I do have some additional comments to share uh, that may help clear that up for you. I'm hoping. Thank you. Any other public comments? Thank you. Susan Hamill, 3 Bay Street. Um, I'm very pleased to see this uh, on the agenda. Um, optimistic that um, this committee could get to work and um, have some impact and um, just uh, cheers for, for creating the committee and, and um, let's uh, roll up our sleeves. So, thanks. Ben Howard, Seven Windsor Ponds. Again, I think it's a uh, a great idea. Um, definitely, uh, having gotten up and spoken on a number of issues, it's tough to present your idea in a informative way in just three minutes. It's even tougher to not allow people to ask you questions back. So the idea to sort of get the groups that have done a lot of research and spent a lot of time <coughs> of their personal time into one room and discussing, I think it's a great idea, and uh, I, I fully support it. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Sorry, Hillary Durgan, Sequoia Lane. Um, 
this is a question which I know I'm not supposed to do, but after you guys discuss it, then we don't have another opportunity to say anything. So, right. um, I, so you said there would be four other members. Who picks those members? Sorry. Usually Tom. So I think, oh. right. I guess my, I guess I, I like the, I mean, the, I don't have any problem with dialogue, but um, none of us, uh, I, I guess I would just like to know more about it bef before I can make an informed statement. So what I would like to do is, um, after public comment, is to have a conversation with the council, and I think that um, that will answer it. And of course, our emails, um, based upon everyone's email communications lately, I know that you can definitely get in touch with us if you have more comments and questions. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'd like to, uh, if there's any other comments um, from the public, then um, I'd like to move to uh, close those comments and then have us talk about this. So not seeing any, we'll close the public comment. Is there, um, if Councillor Foley, if you could read the motion as a motion, or read the resolution as a motion. Both pages, the whole thing, okay. Uh, so be it resolved by the Council of the Town of Scarborough, Maine and Town Council assembled that whereas the town and budget, town and budget, school budgets affect every person in the Town of Scarborough and whereas the school budget validation vote has failed with the voters of Scarborough repeatedly in recent years and Whereas residents have been clear in their interest to better understand the process used to generate town and school budgets and in their desire to have clearer channels to communicate with the town council regarding budgets and whereas the town council form of government is a represent representational form of government that allows for citizen advisory groups to inform its decision making and whereas in an effort to identify strategies for improving communications and outreach regarding the budget process and to create an opportunity for a diverse citizen group to report to the council on a balanced approach to meet the above mentioned challenges. Now therefore be it resolved by the Scarborough Town Council in Town Council assembled that, that there is hereby an ad hoc budget advisory committee created and the membership terms, offices and duties shall be as follows. Number one, the purpose. The purpose of the budget advisory committee is to advise the town manager and town council on strategies to better promote community understanding of budget processes and support greater acceptance of results of the annual budget process shown by a positive school budget validation vote. The committee will propose improvements to the budget process and will identify additional communication and outreach opportunities. The following is a general overview of the discussion points, expectations, and deliverables the committee should consider in arriving at its recommendations. Uh, Establish a baseline of facts regarding the costs associated with the delivery of current and historical service levels by benchmarking Scarborough's costs to those in other communities through available data sets. Identify common goals among all Scarborough stakeholders. Consider ways to improve the current budget process. Develop suggested outreach and communication strategies. And then provide ongoing feedback and support to the Joint Finance Committee throughout the budget process. The committee's powers and duties shall not exceed those prescribed herein or otherwise restricted by town council rules, policies, and charter. Membership. The membership intends to provide fair representation of key stakeholders across age, income, and duration of residency demographics. Members should be sought out who have unique experience in budgeting, accounting, public policy, or community engagement. The committee shall be limited to Scarborough residents and comprised of nine members as follows. Uh, two town councilors representing both the Finance and Communications Committee, one school board member, preferably from the School Finance Committee, uh, a member of the Save Our Schools group, a member of the Smart Taxes group, four additional members to be selected through an open application process. Uh, although official membership is limited to members, the committee is encouraged to draw upon other resources, resources and invite other key stakeholders to participate in the proceedings as they feel appropriate. The time frame, the committee shall recommend and report their identified goals and agreed upon deliverables to the town council by the first town council meeting held in December. Upon acceptance and approval of the council, the committee will shift its focus to then meeting those goals and deliverables by continuing to meet, support, and implement the identified activities, events, and outreach throughout the budget season, culminating with the June referendum. And a yes vote, I added that. Vacancies and removal. Any vacancies shall be filled by the town council. The town council may remove any member of the committee by vote of a majority of its members for misconduct or non-performance of duty. Officers, the committee shall elect a chair and recording secretary from among its members. 
The chair shall be counted to determine a quorum and shall have the same rights as other members of the committee, including the right to vote. Quorum and voting. A quorum shall consist of five members. The concurrence of a majority of the members pre present and voting shall be necessary to decide any question before the committee. Uh, meeting and records. The committee shall meet often enough, at least monthly, to complete its responsibilities within the deadline set and shall strive to meet bi-monthly on a date and time specified by a vote of the majority of the committee at its first organizational meeting. Other meetings may be called by the chair, provided that the chair shall call a meeting of the committee upon the request of at least three members. The committee shall keep minutes, minutes of its meetings and submit them to the town's clerk. Okay. Is there um, a second? Second. Council Foley. Peter. Peter. Um, so it was great that you asked those questions because those are all a lot of questions a lot of people have. And so I do have something I want to read and offer to uh, my fellow counselors before um, they engage in conversation. Uh, as I haven't had a chance to even get feedback from all of these folks yet. So, um, so what I know to be true and that's become clear to me through some really productive conversations and feedback from others is that uh, in my eagerness to try to do something I saw as very good for the town, I skipped uh, what is really the most criti critical step in uh, truly inclusive and collaborative uh, processes and work. And that is that the collaborators themselves need to be involved from step one and not inserted at step two. So they need to be a part of the design. Um, so as written, this resolution solely includes my initial thoughts and ideas and therefore, uh, I'm not convinced that voting on this tonight is what's necessarily best for us or best for the town. I am convinced that what we do need to, that what we need to do needs to be different from what we've done in the past, and my preference would be to convene, if willing and able, the full board of, uh, board of education and full council for a workshop to proceed either our September 6th or se September 20th meeting to brainstorm and vet out some more of the details, answer some more of those questions. Uh, around the charge of the committee, the composition, the duration, etc. Uh, simply sending this back to just the finance committee or the joint finance committee, uh, as was suggested at our last meeting to my way of thinking, does not accomplish the goal of doing something different um, or being inclusive of more voices. So I'm prepared to offer a motion to table this um, so that more time can be afforded to address some of these questions and concerns that have been raised. Uh, to allow uh, more time for other stakeholders to weigh in and give us some feedback, and so that any legal implications of uh, working together in this way can also be clearly understood uh, by both the council and the Board of Education. Uh, but before I make that motion to table, I would like to hear uh, what my fellow counselors are thinking um, around the support of this idea and how we might best move this concept forward. And then I'm going to add one thing and I'm going to stop. Um, so some of the identified uh, names or space holders, um, if we got a name wrong, that was honestly a, a error of timing and uh, editing. I think Tom was gone for two days. He sent me a draft. I looked at it quickly within two hours because it had to be on Fridays uh, on the website by Friday. So those things we may not have perfectly uh, put together, but uh, understand the intent is really trying to think about uh, a variety of people that we could bring together. So, I'll <coughs> Comments from Council? Council Chiazzo. So um, I'll start off with positive comments. I think it's the right intention. I think it's um, the right idea to get more voices at the table. Um, but I got three kind of real main reasons why I don't think this is the right idea right now and in this form. Um, the first and foremost is, is I think it attempts to meet a, a non-existing need. And what I mean by that is I'll break down the purposes here. So the first one was to advise the town manager and town council on strategies to promote better community understanding of the budget process. I understood that's the charge of the communications committee. So we have a committee that exists that is responsible for that and is taking that under their purview. So I, I would, wouldn't want to repeat and duplicate those efforts there. The second one is to support greater acceptance of results of the annual budget process. Um, I think that's why we have the vote for the school budget. And, and I think that's 
really um, the opportunity for the check back of is it the right approach for the town or not. Uh, that's really the only hard anecdotal, real, excuse me, the only hard real evidence that we have that we can all agree to is certifying the vote at the end of the budget. Um, C, purpose of improvement, the purpose is, is improvements to the budget process. Again, I think that's the purview of the Finance Committee. I think we've all agreed to, to take that on. Um, that's kind of really where I think that process should lie because the, the budgets are very complex and, and complicated and I think we've got, we work very hard with staff and with um, specialists uh, to, to work through that. And in that process, within the process that we currently have, there's public comment at all the Finance Committee meetings. There is regular public comment at the Town Council meetings. And to some of the other councilors' points, we're always available. Anybody can call us, send us an email, and say, hey, if you know the three-minute exchange, granted, is not really uh, the best way to exchange ideas, but I've certainly met with constituents one-on-one, -on -one, exchanged ideas, had dialogues, had discussions. So I don't necessarily think that we're closed off and we're not available and, and there isn't an ability to approach us and uh, through the existing processes that we have. Um, and the third one was to identify additional uh, communications and outreach opportunities. Again, I think that's why we established the, co the communications committee this year. And I, I think it, those are all very important goals, but I think we've kind of met them through, or we can meet them through existing infrastructure and through existing processes that we have now. The second thing is the timing of the motion. Um, we're still operating without an approved operational budget. And um, I, I'm not quite sure that while this may address some of the structural issues that we've heard and some of the structural concerns that we have, it doesn't really address any of the fiscal issues associated with the current budget. And I think it's more of a, a um, it's more of a structural issue. So when we developed the Communications Committee and we, when we changed the purview of the Appointments Committee to the <coughs> Negotiations Committee, we had several meetings both within the individual committees and then collectively as a whole. So if we're going to do a process change, which I really think this is, I, I think we really need to not make it on a snap decision right before a major budget vote. I think it's something that we need to evaluate and review. So I, I, I think that's really addresses the timing of the issue uh, of, this, of this motion. And the third and final one is, is really the naming of specific groups in, in the uh, composition. So as, a, as the chair of the Appointments and, and Negotiations Committee, who's responsible typically for filling those vacancies in the ad hoc committees and the existing committees, I went through and looked and to see if there was really any precedent that we have, either in charter or in existing committees, of really calling out specific non-town non related groups or non-town associated groups like planning or staff members. The only one I could find was um, the Firing Rage Committee. And the reason I think that there's two specialists, if you will, in the Fire Range Committee is, is really for safety reasons. Two of them have to have special NRA certifications. One is a representative of the Scarborough Gun Club and the other is the member of Scarborough Fish and Game Association. So when we go and I, I'm very, very concerned when we call out specific groups regardless of which side they're on because I think for every group that we agree should have a seat at the table, there's probably two or three others that feel they also should be there. And I, I'd hate to see us in a position where we're picking and choosing who gets to sit? I'd rather see an open forum and an open discussion where anybody, like the communications roundtables, <coughs> anybody can come and express a concern or an issue or an opinion. And if we start naming specific groups, I think that's a very, um, it, it sets a precedent that I, I think it would be very, very difficult to, to then retract from. So, so again, I appreciate the, 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 the motion. I think it's, it, it gets us going in the right direction. I just don't think that this is the right mechanism for it. And I'd, I'd rather see it, if it's structural, see it looked at more from a whole com uh, council standpoint with a little bit more time to review it and certainly take it up in finance and see if that's something that we can add value to our process that way. Councilor Hayes, you had your hand up before, did you? Yeah, and I, and I think, and I guess um, just process-wise, where, where we are in this process is is Councillor Foley has put out a concept of maybe is this something we want to explore further and maybe a workshop, the, the, the concept and try to flush it out more. And I would totally support that. I think I think this is very consistent with what we've been hearing from the community. And, and, I, and I'll share, you know, Council St. Clair and I just 
were on an ad hoc committee that was for the public safety building, and that was a really well, really high performing group. Um, we did have the right individuals at the table. They worked collaboratively. They they really came up with some great ideas and some great concepts. So I think, as we had talked about, we're all talking about we need a different process to move forward. I'm not quite sure what that process is, but I, I like the suggestion of taking this as a starting point and then maybe having those conversations about how do we move forward, where does it sit, does it sit, as you have suggested, in far, where is it? So I would really support committing at least as a council to start the conversation, have workshops, explore a concept. This, you know, as Katie said, this may not be the, the end all to be all, but it's a starting point. So I'd very much support that conversation. Council Rowan? Yeah, I think um, when I first read it, I had um, um, similar concerns. I, um, I questioned the, the charge and the duration and the membership and, and some of the um, other thoughts that I had is that, you know, a lot of our ad hoc committees turn into permanent committees, and so then you want to think about, um, um, you know, term duration. And, um, and we, what we really want to do for something like this is ensure that we have balance on that committee, and I think that was some of the intent of around um, naming folks in the membership. Um, and so I had an opportunity to speak with um, Councillor Foley and, and kind of understand some of the motivation. And I, I really um, uh, love the, the concept and like the idea of having more dialogue. It does feel like some of the um, interactions that we have is kind of one way, and we kind of run that risk of talking past each other. Um, and uh, um, so I, I really like the concept of having it as a, as a workshop. And the outcome of that workshop might very well be something very similar to this, and in which case at least we've had an opportunity to have broad consensus and, and ideas expressed and, and uh, included the school board and, and school administration and as well as the other council members. So I, I, I love the idea of <coughs> uh, tabling and, and turning it over to a workshop. St. Clair. Um, so I also had a chance to talk to a little bit with Councilor Foley about it. Um, a couple of my concerns, and one thing that I had asked for and asked her to do, and, and I, w I would support um, tabling this and looking at it in a different way, um, was because I did make a commitment to um, residents to hold that budget roundtable at the end of the month, and I felt like it was important for me um, to stick to that and get that feedback. And if we were to create something like this tonight, what am I supposed to do with these people at the end of the month? I kind of would be a waste of their time to come and talk to me about process and procedure when we've already put something in place. Um, so that was a, a major concern for me. Um, uh, you know, I also have, I do have to um, pick up on something that Councillor Rowan said. Um, a lot of times ad hoc committees do become full-time committees, and I did have a concern that there wasn't um, an end date with this ad hoc group. I didn't see an end. There was, I'm sorry. The yes um, vote. <laughs> well, right, but yeah. No, no guarantee on that. Right. So um, anytime there isn't an, an, uh, an end date, um, sometimes it runs into something that we don't necessarily want it to run into. Um, and I'm not saying that that is what would happen here, but we have seen that before. Um, and then it's very hard to stop those committees from doing their good work, so to speak. Um, I. I am um, always a, a, a proponent of communications. I like to talk. I like to listen to people. I love meetings. I love hearing your perspective. I love talking to residents. That's the, really the only reason I still continue to do this job. Um, so I love that part of it. Um, and I would support um, tabling it and doing some sort of, um, I think it just needs some, I ne it needs some fine tuning and some tweaking. Yeah, I share the comments made by several people that uh, it needs to be uh, uh, evaluated much more deeply, uh, tabling it, uh, whether it's a workshop or uh, I see the role of the uh, communications committee and the finance committee as uh, uh, needing to be uh, properly uh, uh, included in this as well as some of the other comments. So I. I think tabling it at this point is quite appropriate. Ms. Foley? So I just wanted to touch on a few things that were brought up. So number one, around timing. Um, 
I totally saw Kate's dilemma and appreciated it. I also thought, uh, thought it was appropriate to try to, again, show action versus just talking about making changes that actually shows a commitment to making some change. And in my way of thinking, that was going to help get us to yes. So that was part of my motivation. Um, I, want, I appreciate what Councilor Chiazzo said about the communications committee. Um, however, I, I feel like something as big as this needs a really focused group, whereas the communications committee is just now, you know, finally got their strategic plan draft all together, and the, really they're in charge of, like, I see that as an overall uh, high-level uh, piece, not necessarily focused on every single one issue, and I want, I want this to be, I want there to be no excuses for anyone to say I didn't know this about this. Um, and I know we feel like we did that already, but I want it to be even uh, more flooded. Um, and the other thing I think that is created in, in doing something like this is that you, know, you, you create the local champions, whether people agree or disagree when they leave uh, a committee meeting, they can go back to the folks in their circle and share that information. And then for me, it's, it's kind of like the story of the cold pricklies and the warm fuzzies, you know, it spreads. And so my idea and thought was if we can create those kinds of different champions for the budget in those other areas with a better understanding, the facts that as we uh, know them to be, um, then getting to yes isn't going to be as big of a fight. So those were all parts of my, again, motivation and intention, understandably uh, not tweaked where it is, but this was the process that was available to me in a short amount of time. So I agree it's not the best process, and so I will make a motion to table. Second. Jesus. <laughs> Sorry. Well, out of the spirit of the motion, oh, thank you, you for didn't get not to letting talk. me speak, I'm but that's okay. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe that is actually better. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, if you don't mind, I'd like to just make one comment. I'll withdraw um, my second. You thank can withdraw you. withdraw your motion. So I, I agree um, with a lot of statements that have been made. I think that the intent is meaningful, and I think the purpose is also specific. Um, given the conversations that we have had. I have one glaring problem, and that needs to be addressed as part of that workshop. We have left out a, a significant part of a relationship that we have with the school board um, because it talks about us, us being the town council. We have more members on, the board, on this committee than the school board does. The town council is the one that has to approve the goals and the recommendations but yet the implications could be extremely significant on the school side without their approval and their partnership. It dismantles a relationship that we've taken a lot of time and effort in building, and I just hope that we take that into consideration when we move this to a workshop of the, of the whole council because that will be a critical part of me supporting this going forward. So with that, I would entertain a motion to table to, um, I would recommend based on our schedule to the September 20th meeting. So if that's a motion. That's and, a motion. And Council Donovan, did you want to second that? Second. I'm sorry, can I get clarity? The two things. One, I thought we were talking about a joint workshop, and mm -hmm. second, um, you're tabling the you're tabling this until the 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 twentieth of September, so we'd have the workshop and then immediately go and have action. Um, well we can schedule well, the we workshop before yeah. that. So that'd have to be on the same day. We'd probably have it a week or two. We only have it a couple of weeks anyways, but yeah. And the, and then about the joint. Was it were we intending to have a joint? I think we can talk about that because that's more process than uh, what day. our expectations are. So okay. we can talk about Great. the composition of the workshop then. Thank you. I think we have to keep in mind the school board schedule when we're talking about a workshop because they also have, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So for now, the motion is to table this until the September 20th meeting, and I will talk with everyone, including the school board, about the joint workshop option. That is not debatable, so all those in favor of tabling, them, uh, tabling this until September 20th. And that is unanimous. Thank you. 10 o'clock. Sorry, Tom. Mm. Sorry. It's 9.58. No, 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 it's 10 o'clock. Sorry, Tom. Oh, it's 9.59 now, so order number 17-081, act to approve the town manager's recommendation for the implementation of the metered parking fees for an executive summary at highest level I'll turn it over to the town manager. Yeah, technically, I, I don't think this needs council action, but given the interest and some sensitivity around it, um, I brought it forward at your last meeting, and I bring it back to you this evening for uh, your final blessing. I do see value in getting this in place this fall so I can have some uh, short-term experience, and we can be in a position in the spring to uh, 
hit the ground running, so to speak. Um, I'm pleased to go back through the proposal, but um, in the interest of time, perhaps I won't. And any public comment? Not seeing any. Is there a motion from Council? So moved. Second. Comments and questions? Council St. Clair? Yeah, I don't agree with that. Okay. Would you like to add to that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right then. <laughs> I do not like it. I do not want it. Um, I didn't. I. I. I mean, we. I, we can go back two years ago. I didn't want metered parking down there in the first place. I lost that. That battle. That was fine. I'm over it. Clearly. Um, I, I. The. I think what you're asking for, and I'm sorry, I don't have it right in front of me, but the timing that you're asking for is for like six, starting at six a.m., going till ten. Is that what it says? Charge fees for the uh, the entire time that you're allowed to park there. Yeah. Okay, so I would like to make a uh, a motion. Can I do that? Make amendment. An amendment? Yeah. Um, I'd like to move approval to modify the town manager's recommendations for metered parking fees to require payment only between the hours of 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Is there a second? Second. Sorry. Comments, questions? Um, Councilor Chia sorry, Councilor Chiazzo. No, go ahead. Okay, sure. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I didn't see you. Okay. Um, I just, I, 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 my concern is that I think we're getting greedy. I'm just going to say it. Um, I think that we have, um, and I understand that um, if they are senior citizens, um, they do not have to pay. Um, uh, what about handicap? Does handicap have to pay? There's no provision. No provision for that. Okay. So uh, there is a lot of elderly or, or there's also a lot of people that go down there early in the morning before work to walk their dogs. They're there for half an hour, 20 minutes. Um, they go down, they come back, they leave. Um, I just feel like 9 to 5, we're, we're, okay, we're stepping it up a, a level. I feel like if we go from not charging to then charging all 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, it's just too much at one time. I would like to see this in a stepped motion. Let's see how what garner, what comes from nine to five, and then if the council next year, so be it, decides to change that, I may not be here to do anything about it. Um, but at this point, I would like to see it say nine to five. I apologize. Councilor Chiazzo. So I, I I can appreciate Councilor St. Clair's vehement opposition to it, and I understand that. Um, I guess I look at it this way. We've, we, we had a discussion in, in finance. It's part of the budget, and we have to give the town manager authority to implement those actions, and um, I do think there are alternative areas for parking. I believe the main lot is still available prior to 9, um, mm -hmm. so I, I don't think we're restricting necessarily beach access or by charging a fee at that point. Uh, I think we've in, empowered the town manager to implement that policy, and I would support uh, how he wishes to do that. So, if you don't mind, councilors, I would like to break protocol. Um, I believe a citizen did not hear me say that there was a public hearing and then close it. So, if you don't object, I'd like to have her speak if she would like. Thank you. You're welcome. We'd let questions go. So. I couldn't hear you. So, speaking of senior citizens, I'm Jane Wagner. Berwink Road, I, I wasn't really prepared to talk, but um, I would like to address this. Uh, I have spoken to a few members of the council. I've written letters. Um, I agree. I thank you for that. I think it is becoming um, a financial um, gain, maybe, that you're seeking. I'm not sure. I'm confused on the reason why you're feeling as though now what used to be a free asset for anybody to come and enjoy an hour of the beach um, has to be taken away. I question um, a few other things like the, the officers that I see almost every morning that are um, on the beach when I'm thinking the amount of money we maybe pay for them, even though it may be a small portion, how is that going to balance out with that one dollar that you're getting for 13 spaces? So I, I'm just, I'm confused. I haven't gotten a straight answer. I don't live on the beach. I, I'm there often. I love the beach. I was gone. I've moved back. I think it's one of the things, and it's not just that beach. I think our beaches in Scarborough 
make us the type of community people remember. I mean, it's obvious. Look at the tourists. Look at the people that I have heard comments this year and starting last year. They've seen a change. I've noticed a change. I feel animosity when I walk down there now between groups that I never felt in the 60s and the 70s growing up. I, you know, it, I know things change. I get it. I'm a mom. I was a teacher. I just think maybe if everybody can get along, and I just feel as though the, the one hour which is being taken, one dollar which may be taken and raised up to two dollars, et cetera, where are we leading? And I, I just really urge the council to step back and think about it and think, is it really worth stepping that up when maybe we can put some effort in other areas. I don't understand. So I, I appreciate any, um, any maybe clarification that I don't seem to get. But there are a lot of people that I've spoken to that have not had a chance to come up or haven't taken it upon themselves. But it'd be really great to kind of maybe meet in the middle somewhere. So I thank you. Thank you very much. Back to council comments, Council Foley. Um, so I was um, pretty adamantly opposed to the meters in the first place. That's not a big surprise to anybody who knows me. Uh, access is something that I am pretty passionate about. And um, it's not just for dog walkers. <laughs> it's for, uh, you know, there's fishermen. I have a, a friend who likes to go and fish down at the point and in that low tide. I mean, just walking all the way down there and casting, he might get two or three casts in, and now he has, then he has to turn around to, to even do that for in and hours is uh, pretty restrictive as it is. So I do feel like this is another step towards um, what people feel as restrictive. That said, the meters are there, and so, and so are the police. So um, I, I'm not opposed to meeting in the middle and uh, supporting 9 to 5. Um, I, was, I didn't have time, and I apologize to go back. I, uh, I feel like um, the, somebody reported out to us about how many towns do you go and pay for meters. Uh, like if you go into the city of Portland, after 5 or 6 o'clock, the meters are free. So especially that evening time felt uh, over the top restrictive to me. So I'd love to see the morning and the evening still be a free, still restricted to an hour. That seems to have, I've heard from people in the community who, um, you know, felt like they needed some help and support, that it has made improvement for them. And so, okay, we, we made some improvement. I don't want to go so far over that uh, that we swayed back the, uh, the pendulum back the other way. So I, I can meet in the middle and support 9 to 5. Um, it will bring in some revenue. It will give us some indication of what we might potentially make. I, I think 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. is a bit over the top. Council Rowling? So I, I was hoping just to ask the, the manager. He's written in his recommendations um, that the reason why he's recommending that we charge at all available times was for simplicity's sake. Um, are you prepared to, to uh, speak to the complexity that this would add? Not, or you, would you just take that away? It's not really complexity. I mean, I think there is simplicity to have it apply to all allowable hours. I think it, it's the simplest way to approach it. Uh, beyond that, given where we are with the, the enforcement, I don't expect we'll be removing enforcement for those early morning or evening hours. So we're going to have staff there that's no savings uh, unless the council chooses to have us reduce that uh, presence that, that currently is there. I expect we would continue that. Thank you. Sorry, I was looking at some information data. Um, Council Donovan. Uh, I, yeah, I oppose this motion to amend for the obvious reason that it's fundamentally unfair. Uh, this whole issue is fairness. Uh, what you want to do is not favor one group of people showing up at the beach versus another time. So people from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m., they show up, they get off free. The person who doesn't want to get out there, a senior citizen, an older person, maybe gets out there at 10. person who works uh, at a job at Hannaford, uh, uh, they have an hour for lunch. That's the only time they can get down there. So they pay. Uh, it makes no sense 
to favor one class or group of people over another. Also, 90% of the tickets that were issued were issued to out-of-town people. Fundamental fairness says uh, that these people have not contributed to the maintenance of the beach or the, all the infrastructure costs that have been put into the beach by uh, the town. It's quite appropriate that they pay the, and participate uh, in this process. And so that's why I very much appreciate the town manager having uh, uh, favoring Scarborough residents so that we have revenue contributed largely by out-of-town people uh, and that we not discriminate in favor of one class or group of people uh, over another. Also, yes. and, and I guess as kind of a point of clarity that I think how we got to this discussion, it actually came up in the budget process and we were actually looking at one of the processes. We were looking at how do we get to our numbers, and we mentioned that, you know, we needed about $8,000 in parking revenue. That's how we got to where we got to. That equates to four or five hours a day. So that's how I got to we would charge for part of the day, and I thought that was sort of what we were going to come back with a recommendation saying we were going to put in hours on the meters that equated to approximately getting that $8,000 we wanted for the budget, that was the number, that was the number we're looking for. Um, I certainly have, and, and I, I appreciate Councillor Donovan's comments, but I have gotten a lot of emails and a lot of comments about the parking meters at Higgins Beach. It is a contentious issue for our community. And again, I think a compromise of nine to five is, is a way that that kind of bridges a gap. It's not perfect, and if what we're trying to do is, as Tom has described to the town manager, we want to try, I mean, we've already missed most of the summer for the parking revenue anyway. So I very much support modifying this nine to five. Um, I'm not comfortable going all the whole time six to 10. Council Chiasa. So if I could please, um, through the chair, could Tom, could you explain what uh, beach passes impact or how that would work for, for beach pass holders or uh, people who are in town and have those, they wouldn't be charged, correct? No, my understanding. No, my, th certainly that's always been part of my proposal that if you purchase a uh, season's beach pass, mm -hmm. um, that would enable you to park free. At any time? At any time. Okay, thank you. Council Rowan. Uh, so um, my understanding is that the residents over 60 can have a free season's pass. Um, and I, I think the other thing that I've noticed, because I work in Portland and, and uh, uh, often park on the street. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so I work in Portland and I often park on the street. Um, one of the, um, I, th I feel like the main driver there is that they just, that's when they have their hours of enforcement and that's why they have the parking from nine to six. Um, and if we're gonna have staff there to enforce it, um, I feel like the, the given that you get free parking with the beach pass and it is a, a uh, matter of fairness that everybody everybody who parks there pays unless they have a beach pass. Um, I, I don't see the point in, in restricting the hours. Comments. Um, the only comment I have is that um, what uh, I agree with the comments around the fairness issue. I do want to mention that at least for my own consideration this was not an issue about monetary, and a, nor was it about the budget. This was actually discussed two years ago as part of the, uh, as part of, um, the council's actions in implementing meters and the whole meter system. That's why two years ago we actually placed in our fee structure, even though it was set at zero, a, um, a, a um, hourly rate um, was put into that, into that fee structure. So this is something that didn't just happen this year. It actually had the conversation two years ago, and I think this was just a natural transition into that uh, conversation as from a policy perspective, not just from a monetary one. And um, I think that um, I, I'm happy with the manager's recommendation. I don't feel that there is a need to amend that. With that, is there any other comments? Not seeing any. The motion on the floor is to amend and to change the hours of operation, or the hours of the meter uh, from no, to 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. All those in favor of the motion? Three, all opposed? Four, thank you. Now, uh, main motion as unamended, um, as recommended by the town manager. Is there any other comments? 
Not seeing any. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. I just Nothing had a question. Um, good. Um, in there, it indicates the um, uh, the expectation that coins will be preferred choice uh, to avoid credit card charges. I, I assume that that's because the credit card charge will include a surcharge to the yes. taxpayer that uh, to the, to the individual. I, I'm speculating, but th there will be a third party vendor that tra that handles that transaction, and they typically do have a percentage that they charge. Well, he would vote gotcha. for that, right? Uh, but I may be wrong, and people choose to do that anyway. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Not seeing any, all in favor of the main motion? One, two, three, four, all opposed? One, two, three, that passes. There are no uh, non-action items. Moving into item number nine, standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. I hope that given the hour um, in our reports that we might be cognitive of a abbreviated version of your remarks. But I'll start with uh, Councilor Chiazzo. So um, I'll just be very, very brief. brief. Um, I wanted to give a comprehensive plan update from the Long Range Planning Committee. Uh, there's a lot of activities going on. We're really starting to pick things up. Um, so uh, a couple of highlights this summer. Um, we've added a dedicated comp plan section to the town website. We've launched a separate community engagement website at scarboroughengaged.org. And that's, as it sounds, Scarborough, E-N-G-A-G-E-D.org, all one word. Uh, I would hope, uh, the, and hopefully that's up on our website as well as a link. Mm -hmm. um, we'll begin a series of four general outreach meetings in different areas of the town. Uh, we've established an evening meetings with the Long Range Planning Committee dedicated specifically to the comprehensive plan. We've begun outreach to the community on Planapalooza. That's, there's been some question about the, the, the naming of that, but that's basically the, the group, uh, uh, the opportunity for everybody to come together and uh, for the planning process, uh, which will take place on the week of September 25th, and we've begun collecting data on growth, development, and natural resources. So um, long-range planning committee meetings, um, based on the comments at the kickoff meeting, we wanted to make long-range planning meetings more accessible. During the duration of the comprehensive plan process, the long-range planning committee will meet on the first Thursday of the month in the evenings from 6 to 7.30 p.m. And we'll normally meet at town hall if space is available. Otherwise, I'm sure we'll put up on the website if we have to relocate to other areas. Everyone is welcome to the meetings, and there will be time for public comment. And the area meetings have begun. There was no, So these meetings are being conducted at various areas around town. There are the exact same meetings. So if you missed last night's, which was in two places, the North Scarborough Grange Hall and Higgins Beach, uh, if you missed that, there is one on Thursday at Pine Point Fire Station, Thursday, August 17th. Uh, and those start from 6 to 7.30 p.m. And there's also one on Thursday, August 24th at the Scarborough Public Library. So those meetings are all identical. They're part of the um, Scarborough Impact for the Future, and it is a um, meeting to tell us about Scarborough, your ideas will shape the town for years to come. All meetings will be, will cover the same comment and run 6 to 7 30 p.m. and, uh, six, excuse me, 6 to 7 30 p.m. and anybody can attend at any location. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Councilor, um, Councilor Hayes. Nothing this evening. Councilor St. Clair. Good. Councilor Donovan. Uh, planning Board met August uh, 7th. Uh, uh, extensive review of both the sign ordinance uh, uh, and the Higgins Beach Character Code ordinance. Uh, a positive recommendation from the planning board on both, but I would qualify that that they had considerable number of questions uh, uh, that were helpful, I thought, in, uh, in uh, uh, being able to improve the sign ordinance. Gateway Commons, uh, which we all recall, uh, received its final site plan review approval, uh, but we did not have uh, any information on a phasing schedule. Uh, I'll get that from uh, from Jay Chase uh, for the next meeting and report that out at that time. Councilor Rowan. Thank you. Uh, Scarborough Housing Alliance met. Um, it um, has had trouble uh, with a quorum. There are two um, uh, vacancies on that committee. Um, but um, we did have a developer who had taken a density bonus um, up here before the committee uh, in, interested in um, guidance in terms of uh, the, the um, we had changed from 120 percent of area median income to 80 percent that he had received the, the bonus prior to that and so had question about the uh, what would happen and, and the committee is 
uh, needs to be have a quorum to uh, make a recommendation. Unfortunately, um, the scene, the uh, 55 plus advisory committee um, met twice, um, uh, d had discussion about the outdoor space um, membership structure and fees, um, and there had been some consternation around the membership structure and fees, and and they just wanted to get. Um, information out that they're not making any changes at this point. They're just looking in terms of uh, what they might do in terms of changing the membership. They have um, taken feedback around tr maybe charging non-members a little bit more for some of the trips. Um, um, also, there was some concern that, that uh, around the discussion about Martin's Point that maybe they weren't really welcome there, and that's not the case. Martin's Point loves having them there, um, and uh, they love being at Martin's Point. It's just been a, a space crunch issue. Um, speaking of Martin's Point, they have chair yoga Thursdays at 9 a.m., um, and next week in Memorial Park is the summer barbecue, um, so they can accommodate more uh, individuals, um, but you still need to register so they have a head count, um, and they're going to be uh, some of the, um, the outdoor space games um, will be present um, Bocce, croquet, uh, cornhole, um, so it should be should be fun. It'll be um, uh, the bus, um, the uh, bus is in the normal the normal student parking lot at the for the high school students. Um, we'll be busing down, and that'll start at 11 a.m. next Wednesday. Thank you, Council Foley. Not much. Um, actually, the my committee's canceled, and I thought this was interesting because they wanted to make sure that people weren't. Uh, double dipping because of the comp plan uh, neighborhood meetings and I, I thought that was a great idea and I think that we should all be try to be cognizant as we go forward but I feel like the comprehensive planning uh, opportunities to get involved have been shadowed a little bit because of all the but for good reason but um, I, I don't want us to as a community to miss that opportunity uh, to get people excited and involved so um, the only other thing is the communications table or meeting committee did meet. We did submit our first draft and looking for feedback from the chair and when we get that we'll get it to everybody I would assume for uh, feedback and then the round table next Wednesday not the end of the month. A week from today. Right. 23rd. And um, as chairman I only have one item that I'd like to uh, share and hand out to each of you. So we've had a couple of conversations and uh, we're a little late because of uh, some distractions with uh, referendums. But I do want to at least hand out, um, it's that time of year for us to check in on our goals and where we are. So what I've done is I've provided a copy of the, uh, the narrative statement, but then also the presentation that had the matrix and um, what all of our uh, core goals were, the outcome and actions, and then also what, we're, what we consider would be successful measures or metrics. What I'd like to ask um, is from each of you, and I will also send this by email so that if you are um, privy to do that, um, it is in a PDF format, I believe or PowerPoint. PowerPoint. PowerPoint, so you might need, you might need to be able to have that program. Um, you're welcome to just resubmit it back to me um, electronically, but if you could, please go through each of these, um, the metrics, um, and assign a rating of one to three. Um, one is um, we were unsuccessful, three is that we were successful, and two is um, that kind of, uh, that balanced area where, um, you know, we've uh, been, do we're at least moving forward towards it or we're moving far away from it. It's kind of that transition. So if you can do that for me and then also provide any personal comments, I'll try to summarize all of that so that we can then have a workshop in September um, around this issue. Council Kez. Could staff put that on uh, SharePoint as well? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions for the, about this? Pretty easy instructions, I hope. And we'll get started on that review process. And with that, turn it over to the town manager for his report. Just three quick things, if I could. I'm very pleased to announce that I have hired Liam Gallagher uh, as new HR director. Um, very pleased with the candidate pool. Uh, Liam comes with uh, quite a bit of municipal experience and uh, I'm extremely pleased to have him part of the senior staff. He'll start with us September 11th. So he's begun already to kind of transition. He's met with the, the folks in the HR office and has already started to uh, form that team. Uh, so very pleased to have him on board. Uh, FEMA flood maps are being reissued. You've, you'll hear more and more about this. There'll be a meeting next week of community officials first. And the next step will be actual official issuance of the maps and that will start the 90 day appeal period. So do, do pay attention. Um, it appears as though this version of MAPS uh, is very similar to the last version. I really can't detect too many changes, uh, but there are impacts in certain areas of town for sure. 
Uh, we continue our struggle with um, beach raking on Pine Point mm -hmm. Beach. I've tried to keep you appraised, and I have talked to the residents, or many of them as well, and they seem pleased with our efforts. We're trying to be smart about our resources, smart about the weather forecast, particularly over the weekends, and the tide schedule. Uh, but it seems twice a day we uh, are reminded of the challenges down there, uh, but doing our best for sure. Um, there's a paving schedule on the website. Uh, there's a fair amount of activity starting tomorrow through the end of next week. Uh, for those of us, Kate and I, that live on the other side of the marsh, that's really where a lot of the activity will happen. Yeah. Uh, but it's important to get this work done while the weather's good and really before school is in. Um, and lastly, I just want to take a moment to uh, recognize uh, uh, Richie Moulton. Um, Tiny was a longtime member of our staff. Uh, with the fire department and now more recently with the fire police. Uh, he was uh, Robbie's younger brother and certainly well known. I was not able to attend the services, but I heard it was just a blockbuster event, um, you know, waiting hours to get in. And that really was a testament to how uh, many people that Tony touched in this town. He'll certainly be missed. Thank you. Council member comments. Council <coughs> Denneman. No. Council Rowan. Thank you. Councilor Foley. Yes. Oh, I mean, no, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Council of St. Clair? No. Councilor Hayes? No, I'm good, thank you. Yes, yeah, one comment. Summerfest, uh, this Friday. Oh, shoot, that was on my list. And I'm going to challenge everybody sitting behind this table. I believe there's a dunk tank. Did you get it? <laughs> I believe there's a dunk tank, and I will bring shorts. I'll if do anybody's it. anybody's willing to sit there, I'm in. Uh, if it means... It, I've got 50 get, bucks ready. <laughs> whatever it takes. Um, so I, I'm, I'm, willing, I'm not doing it alone. I want help. So, I mean, and I also think we have a table case, so I'm not sure if we're going to do how you want to do scheduling or something like that. So... That's all. Um, and I have only two things. One is I um, just want to remind the voters that absentee balloting um, and voting is available during normal business hours at the town clerk's office. Um, and uh, she can share there's a deadline in which you can vote. But uh, please vote early. And I, too, also want to send my condolences to Robbie and his family. Um, I knew Tiny um, only frequently, uh, infrequently. And um, I know he was a big part of the family. And so my condolences to the family um, and to the fire police family as well. Um, and uh, with that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. And all in favor? And that's unanimous. Thank you. Can you go ahead and check and take your one line and get that?